ladies and gentlemen, this is Questlove Supreme. Uh, I am Questlove, your host of the day. We are here with Fontigolo. Fontigolo, where are you at right now? Uh, I'm at the crib, man. I just uh, I came in just straight from the gym, so you know, so I'm sweating. Same. Same, Same here. Yep. Same I'm is. on the north side of forty, bro. I'm on the it's, north side of forty, man. It, it's it's something about uh March that creeps in that says, okay, summer coming. <laughs> Got to get my summer body. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I I mine is picnic body. So. Oh yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Oh, yeah, I want to look halfway presentable at the picnic. Uh, Steve, how are you, pal? I'm good. Really looking forward to this interview, like everybody else. Yeah. How how interesting was your evening? last evening yes um super interesting definitely trying to <laughs> hear you pronounce words and so forth all right steve uh as as you guys know uh i can't stop writing books and one of the things that i am not much of a fan of in the process of book writing is doing the audio books especially when steve is on standby to hear me struggle with college words and uh he, he definitely got an earful last night, but <laughs> look, we, we got more important pressing matters on our hands. Um, let me just say that I know that a lion's share of my personal music knowledge, uh, you know, honestly came into play once hip hop contextualized my parents' boring record collection and made it interesting, which, you know, basically by age 14, 15, 16, of course, I could rattle off any musician's name, um, but I wasn't a slouch either when I was a kid. But, you know, this this knowledge I have of music um, really became a thing when I was a teenager. However, I will say that in my life, in real time, and I'm talking about when I'm seven years old, uh, there were two particular drummers uh, who I idolized. And of course, uh, if you're a longtime listener of the podcast, you already know that I've had the pleasure of doing a one-on-one -on -one with my idol, Steve Perrone, uh, formerly of the Average White Band. Uh, today is no exception. And today we'll actually complete that circle. Because um, if I'm really honest with myself, our guest today might be the first, air quote, fusion drummer that I became familiar with. Um, not exactly by choice, it just so happens that a particular family excursion of 1977 on a trip to Disney World in a van with an 8-track tape player uh, as our entertainment and maybe six 8-track tapes in rotation. And one of those six 8-track tapes had heavy rotation of the debut album of our guest on the show today entitled uh, Garden of Love Light. Mm -hmm. And one song in particular that I know that I personally put 10,000 Gladwellian hours in a practice uh, was a tune called The Sun is Dancing. And um, now that I think about it, I think the very first time that I nerded out on bassist, mega bassist Will Lee of The Letterman Show uh, was more about him playing on that album than it was anything else that Willie has done. Willie's done legendary shit. But I will say that uh, our guest has hands down. I know I know that we've said like, oh, been the soundtrack of our lives, but dog, his resume is beyond impressive. Name it: Whitney, Aretha, Mariah, George Michael, Jeff Beck, um, Devin Campbell. Yeah, yeah, Devin Campbell, Barbra Streisand, Lionel Richie, Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, Dinah Ross, Rachel. My Vision Orchestra, <laughs> Chick Corea. Yeah. Literally, literally, he's worked with everyone but me, and I think, time. I, I think I'm trying to be him. You know what I mean? Um, not to mention, I will say that he's probably the first human being that I've ever taken note of that even mentioned the word that I'm obsessed with now, post pandemic, which is meditation. So, this is a long overdue conversation with the great. Legendary, please welcome Narda Michael Walton, finally the Quest Love Supreme. Yeah. Thank we you so been, much, man. That's been waiting on this a long time, man. Wow. wow, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. This is wonderful. I'm a big fan of yours, brother. I'm a big fan of yours. You know, you bring the funk, man. You bring the soul, and you bring the the integrity to the music. So I'm really, really loving you, man. 
I'm wearing this hat, Quest Love for You. This is uh, my drumming hat in high school, in the high school band. <laughs> So I know you put the drones, man. We put the drones, man. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. You still have that? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I'm yeah. I'm bringing everything I ever learned from you, man. <laughs> so <laughs> now you know what it is. I'm I'm also realizing. Um, I've met you briefly before, and I will say that there are very few human beings that have an instantaneous disarming chip that I wish I had. You have a, a level of calm that I now know that of course your of course your resume is that impressive because I believe that you you have a sort of calming element because you you you've produced some people that I would believe would be some of the hardest people personality wise to even step with i've said no to a few of these people with just like drumming with them or any of those things because i i couldn't bear to think of the thought of you know of of, of dealing with that but can i ask you like what when did you develop this personality of just calmness like you have a very disarming like have you ever gotten angry in your life oh yeah sure <laughs> sure i do of course i do it's just that I, I learned um, like what you're speaking about in pr production, working with other people that I wanted to get their best. And I realized that the love, excuse me, <clears throat> the love aspect was really powerful. It is really powerful. And then you mentioned meditation. So through meditation and the love aspect, that became the, 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 the most important part. And that the person I'm working with could feel that love to do their best. And then that would just make everything just go. So I kind of just prayed, swim, you know, get myself together physically, and then get in that spirit that the person can really feel like, oh, you're not here to fight with me. You're here to, you're here to make that great music. Then they start singing, do whatever they're gonna do, and the endorphins kick in and they were gone. But that spirit of love is really, really important. That's what I want to say to you about that. Do you have a pre-studio ritual um, that you do or something like to kind of get ready to get into that space? You know, uh, I don't know if you can see behind me, I have a candle, two candles here and a candle up there. Okay. You know, I burn a little incense every now and again. I usually bring a gift to the to person I'm working with just to kind of make them feel the the love on a, on a physical level, a teddy bear, a flower, something sweet. And then um, I want to say one more thing about what you're asking about, because it's really important for me that probably the most um, incredible moment along this line was um, after I made the songs of two songs, uh, Who's Zooming Who Until You Say You Love Me and Here and flew back to Detroit, Michigan to meet Aretha. It looking in her eyes is scary. Mm. That would, that would scare you. That would, that scared me. But, <laughs> but there again, you know, I let her know in my spirit, my eyes, my love, I'm not here to fight. I'm not here to make a problem. I want I want to serve you, love you, and and help us make the best music. And then once the music comes on, and then she starts opening up and singing, then again, like I said, it just gets happy. And then then it's like, well, what do you want to eat? You want cheeseburger? You want you know fried chicken? What you want? <laughs> and all that starts happening. <laughs> See, I, I wish I'd known you previously. Steve Steve can attest to this. Um, you know, of course, I'm I'm still here at the the Tonight Show. And, lovely, um, lovely, lovely. And uh, I've only had one client sort of put us through the ringer to the point where I just walked away. Okay. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, of, of I've, I've had the pleasure of playing practically with every person I've ever idolized. But, you yeah. know, I when it came to Aretha and the the alpha level of testing that we were put through, yeah, yeah. I, I failed that test. And, oh, no. <laughs> you know, it, it was like, in my mind, you know, and plus my, my ego was there because in my mind, I'm like, well, I'm holding up the tradition. Like we are holding up the tradition of Cornell Dupree yeah. and Bernard Purdy, like yes. her 70s, her yes. 70s crack band. And, you know, she wanted to have a long talk and she wanted us to audition 
and all this stuff. And, you know, I I just now regret that that move. But I was just like, well, no, I'm fine. If you, if you want to sing behind your karaoke track, then go ahead and do so. And she did so. And it could have been magic, but, you know, it was definitely I, I didn't know about what you just said, like with, with dealing with people and how to disarm them and all that stuff. And so I want, well, there's a lot I want to get to, into. Starters, where were you born? I'm from Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, between Chicago and Detroit, right in the middle of the country, Kalamazoo, <laughs> where they make Gibson guitars, you know, and Battle Creek, Michigan is not far away where they make Kellogg's cornflakes. And that's where Junior Walk All Star comes from, you know, with all that funk. I'm so Cal Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'm only laughing because uh, Kalamazoo is always my go-to random <laughs> okay. hypothetical city when I say something like, oh, you know, all the way in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yeah. But I've never known one human being from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Well, um, now you do. Now you do. I, I read a really interesting story uh, about you in a magazine. I think it was right on. I'm not certain. But the very first thing I ever read about you, uh, I happened to be reading this story a year before we in, in Philadelphia. And I, I don't remember the exact lining of the earth, whatever, but I do know that we were about to go through, um, in 1984, a major solar eclipse. Oh, wow. And it was one of them things where like the school was like handing out these these sunglasses and you must never look in the sun mm -hmm. or else you'll go blind and yes. da, 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 da. yes and i remember reading an interview of you where you said you were so inspired by stevie wonder mm -hmm. that could you tell that story please okay brother it's a true story <laughs> um okay let me just go back up just for a second to say that ray charles george sharing were blind men knocked me out with their genius and then on the scene, my aunts, my mom's sisters, they're Vicky and Valerie, they're, they're twins. They said, well, you know, on the scene now as a little boy your age, maybe a little older than you, but he plays drums better than you play. And he's incredible. I said, no, 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 no. I, was, I didn't want to buy it. And he said, oh, no, his little, name is little Stevie Wonder, you know, and he plays. I said, well, how can he, if he's blind, how can he even see the drums? Well, he does. Okay, 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 okay. But not long after came out a song that was a live version of Fingertips. And fingertips was smoking. And I mean smoking like smoking, smoking. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to go to Chicago. My dad comes from Chicago and go to the Regal Theater and see him play. And when they walked him out, it was like an alien. He walked like an alien, slowly, kind of back and forth. Like, you know, like I'd never seen him even walk like, like he walked. But now in the audience, it's packed with screaming girls, like Beatles, screaming, you know. And when he gets the microphone, he's just in control. And, the, and his, his voice is high, like a little boy, but just every little note, just so perfect. Just so perfect. And the band comes up, just rocking. And on the harmonica, perfect. And I just was like, it's true. He is better than me. <laughs> he's got everyone in his palm of the hand. <laughs> he's he's in, he's channeling God, and um, that was the summer of the eclipse you're talking about. So I, in Chicago, I uh, decided, okay, if I'm blind, I, I can maybe be as good as these guys are, are, are my heroes. So I went <laughs> and stared at the sun, <laughs> I stared at the sun, and make myself blind. <laughs> but the good Lord said, no, 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 you keep your sight. But I did try to make myself blind, yeah. Wow. Oh, I, I read that story and I guess we had, you know, the, the next cycle of that was sometime in 1984. And, you know, again, this, uh, and also, you know, there's a thing like when you're a kid and an adult yeah. tells you no, <laughs> you're just instantly, like, even if it's to your own detriment. And there was one point where I was like, damn, Narda Michael's right. Like, if I'm blind like Stevie Wonder, I too can have gifts. And I was actually thinking, let me go outside and just stay. <laughs> Do you remember your very first musical memory?
when I was really little, my dad bought a record home called Froggy Went a Court and He Did Lie. Froggy Went a Court and He Did Lie. Da, 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 da. You know, I was a little kid, 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 kid. I remember that kind of thing. I also remember very, very young, I was so blessed by Santa with um toy Toyland drum set for Christmas. That blew my mind. These little drums with the paper heads. So you 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 play them, but the heads wouldn't last very long because it's made of paper. But I get orgasmic beating these damn things, and I see the happiness of my parents, my grandparents. And I got so happy. That's it. When I knew that's it. That's a little, little, little kid. I guess just after that would be like then making pillows and getting a pie tin and playing along with Nina Simone live at sound live at town hall, you know, mm. summertime and that album, the live album of hers playing along with that. And then that became like kind of going on like that, you know, Ahmad Jamal and those, those, those type records playing along with them. But yeah, it's just always there. That record, the, the young, the young vibe catching the, 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 the spirit of the music was so, so, wait, so important. Pie tin were you? Yeah. A pie tin, a pie tin. A pie tin. Yeah. We are the same person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, right. so what is so what is the significance of a pie tin symbol? What 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 would we hear that on? Well, you know, it just makes a high high tin. Ting, tink, tink. Oh, so, okay. You know, it kind of if you don't have a symbol, at yeah. least it can make a high kind of a sound like a symbol. So you know, uh yeah. and a pillow, like a flat pillow, can be like a bass drum or whatever you want it to be. I, yeah. I would set up chairs. Yeah, that's like, it. <laughs> I would set up chairs as my drum set and then Either the lamp, lampshade, or a pie tin was always my. Damn, I thought I was the only person that thought about that. No, no, man. <laughs> I bet Stevie wanted to did it too. That is crazy. <laughs> like recently, I went back to uh, my old neighborhood, and I saw uh, there's 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 a lady that, you know still still living and down the block, and she was telling like people stories of like, yeah he used to always wail them drums I used to hear him five, six houses away. So you, your parents lived in a household in which they encouraged you to make noise and all these things. And yeah, yeah, I gotta say my dad was like 18 when he had me. My mom was 19 when he had me. And my dad wanted to be a drummer and he would carry his best friend's drums around and a cat named Bill Dowdy from the Three Sounds. So he wasn't a drummer, but he loved it. So that was what? a big, yes. You know, Bill Dowdy from Three Sounds? Yes. Yes. Well, that was my dad's friend. And I, that's another record I was raised up playing along with. And my dad, quite frankly, the only time he really kind of gave me the, the kudos like I, I, could, I could play was uh -huh. when I could play note for note that record he bought. That was when he knew, oh, well, you guys, you, I guess you can play. But it wasn't until that. Wow. So I'm, letting you, yeah, I'm letting you know that the whole Bill Dowdy thing in our family was a big to, to do. And and I, I was, I could, I could make noise. So you're right. The parents loving you, loving what the sound of it's important. Yeah. How old were you when you first started drumming? Um, a little kid, five, six, seven years old. But I didn't take a snare drum lessons until like 10 years old. You know, rudiment, five, five stroke roll, paradiddles, you know, like that. And then, oh, your left hand is not as fast as your right hand. You got to work on your left hand, all that kind of behavior. But then I'm, I'm really blessed. Maybe around the age of um, 11, 12, there was a drummer, um, on the north side of Kalamazoo, not far from my grandparents' house, named Harold Mason. And Harold was a black cat who knew independency. And he had a, a blue book of independency by Jim Chapin. So that book, you play a right hand written, ching, ching, ka ching, ching, ka ching, ching, ka ching, like that. But then against it on the left hand, the pattern keeps changing. So you mm -hmm. have to kind of, you know, keep reading the, the changing and like learning your mind how to break it up. Then you bring your feet into it, your bass drum, your hi-hat. But then he'd be so advanced, he would say, well, you know, the jazz cats in New York now, you know what they're doing? They aren't just playing two and four in the hi-hat anymore. They're playing chick, chick with the hi-hat. You know, whatever they want to do on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the left foot. I thought that was that would be too much. I don't want to get into all that. I was happy to play two and four on the, on the, on the hi-hat with, with my foot. But he was that advanced, breaking the mind up for independency, which really to this day helped me. A lot of people don't understand. It's like learning to ride a bike. Once you once you can do it, then you can play all kind of all kind of crazy stuff. So it happened early in my life that I got with Harold Mason. And then guess what happened? Harold went on to play the drums for Stevie Wonder. Now Stevie's wow. a little bit older now, you know. Signs to deliver. Those records are out, and they came through Kalamazoo, a place called Western Michigan University, the college. 
And the place is packed to see Stevie Wonder. He's a big star. So here's my teacher, Harold Mason on drums. And the thing that caught the fire is this, and you'll appreciate because you, you, you're, you're bad. Harold starts playing this groove and goes on the bell. Like one, two, three, four. Ding, ticket, ding, 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 ticket, ding, 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 ticket, ding, 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 ticket, ding, ding, ticket, ding, 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 ticket, ding, 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 ticket, ding, 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 ticket, ding, like that. And Stevie's catching fire with us. Stevie runs over, blinds up, pushes this cat off the drums, Harold. Gets on the drums and starts playing the same thing stronger. Ding, 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 ding. I was like, damn. Then Stevie gets crazy. He stands up on the stool and the place goes, he falls off the stool on the floor, gets back up again, falls on the floor and starts playing his groove. I'm like, these people are nuts. They're nuts. But it showed me the level of craziness you can go to. And it's okay. How, okay, so it's you're one of the rare artists that, I mean, we we've had a few artists on the show that have recollections of seeing one concert or two concerts or whatever. But am I to believe that even since childhood you were just regularly seeing shows of, of musicians in Kalamazoo, Michigan? We're in the country, so it's not like I'm in the city. So no, I wouldn't say like I'm, I'm like in New York where you cats were or Philadelphia. No, we're country cats. We're country mice. But, but our ears are big because we're hearing all the music out of Detroit. We're hearing all the music out of Chicago. You know, Five Stair Steps, Curtis Mayfield. We're hearing everything. We're hearing everything. We're hearing the, the brand new Motown, you know, Shop Around, Miracles. We're hearing all the new stuff. You know, Baby, I Need You Love Him. Before he even hears it, it's there at our parties. So that's what it was. It was just hearing the radio. And then I got to say, pop music, like Patti Page, Old Cape Cod, Johnny Mathis, Chances Are. All that music is, is just as huge in, in Michigan. So you wow. love Prince. That's why Prince is so badass. Because Prince not only got the funk, but when he got all the white pop stuff just as strong. That's what it is. Back there, Miss Minnesota, Michigan. Right. It's like whew, a big old gumbo. I see. Were you a big record collector as a kid? Yeah, I love the records. I love the records. And I loved also like um playing that song by the Who. I can see for miles and miles and miles in my basement. That was, that caught my attention. I didn't even know who Keith Moon or anything that was. I just like the, I can see for miles and miles. I can see, you know, that, that power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who, who was your idol drumming wise? Uh, what, wait, do you play any other instruments besides drums? I just play keyboard uh, piano to write my songs, you know, that okay. I have enough keyboards to write. So drumming still your first love. Yeah. Yeah. Who who were your idols? Like, once once you develop your style, like who's the person that I'm that person? Who's your north star? Uh, I learned from everybody. Harold taught me so much. Harold Mason, Stevie, that that that, that thing I just told you about. Right. Um, I was blown out by the charisma of Ringo Starr. I got to tell you on the on the on the on the Ed Sullivan show to see him flirt with the chicks in the upper balcony as he was playing the open slushy hi-hats but smiling at the chicks above i thought that was badass see the charisma aspect got me more than the chops just the, the swinging and the smiling it's like, wow man okay then um uh, mitch mitchell with hendrix was mean okay. was mean so i had to give him a lot of love all right so i've, I've talked to many an artist <laughs> and uh, of a, of a certain age, of a certain age, for a lot of them, their north star was uh, the Beatles on Sullivan. The same way, like mm. twenty years later, of course, like Motown twenty five was another north star moment for people that watched the moonwalk. Can you can you explain? I'm, but I'm more fascinated when black people speak of the Beatles on Sullivan. Like, could you explain what the fascination was? Because was it just that there was nothing else? Like, what made Black people even open to that moment? Well, okay. I knew the Beatles were coming because I saw their album cover in downtown Kalamazoo, and Paul McCartney had a cigarette on the cover. And that was unusual, just to see a cat having a cigarette bowl on the cover. Just small things like that. And then at my school, it was a Catholic school. The girls were already starting to rumble about the, about the Beatles. It was already catching fire. And that was unusual because no one ever talked about music. So here they are rumbling about the Beatles. I was like, really? You guys are into this? So when it hit, and the best thing was this, man, not just that show, but check this out. It'd be John Lennon saying, well, um, our favorite female vocalist, 
is Mary Wells. I was like, damn, Mary Wells, that's, that's Detroit. That's where I live. But little white girls and those brothers at the school, they, who's Mary Wells? It's like, damn, that's Mary Wells. They don't, they, I don't know Mary Wells, they would say. Mm-hmm. And then Rick John would say, well, also our favorite male singer is uh, Little Richard. I was like, Little Richard, Little Richard, that was on a 78, you know, Long Tall Sally, uh, all those records. So, but they had no idea who they were. So the Beatles really educated all these people who I knew, little white kids, whatever, to what was really going down. So I had wow. to, and I liked that. I liked that. That's caught, that caught us because they now they're talking about black people and giving a shine, which we never had. Oh. You know what I'm saying? That was a big okay. to do. And I'm telling you, man, this whole Beatlemania thing was real. So you're born what, 71? What year are you, you born? Yeah, right. 71. Yeah. Okay. So this is like 63, 64. Mm-hmm. That, it was on fire. We'd never experienced anything like, anything like it. Just even the plane, the plane landing, looking at them coming off the plane, people going hysterical. So it just, it just, you go, wow, wow. The music was good, but it was all the frenzy around it. I mean, like, incredible. Damn. But then when they started loving black people, I was like, I like these cats. Because ain't no one okay. else talking, talking, about, talking about Little Richard. Ain't no one else talking about Barry Mary Wells. So that's what it was, man. The catching of all these things that were like, cool. Got it. Got yeah, it. Got yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So how, how far is Detroit from Kalamazoo? And at any point, did you make a move to Detroit? Like, was Motown calling you or that sort of thing? I would love, I would love to have gone to, to, to Motown. I've gone, we would drive to, to Detroit to go visit a family friend or whatever and just go by the street. But, you know, you could never go in there. It was like a sacred territory. You know, you could never go in there. But just to go buy it, just drive by it would be like a big deal. So I don't have any stories of like, you know, going inside there or anything. But okay. we all were just like religion. The chord changes and the way they put it together with the sounds and the great singers. It was just a religion, man. Uh, Damn. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was your... What was your uh, band experience like in your teen years? Like, were you forming bands in high school or? Yes. Yeah. My first band was, I was 11 and he'd be 10. He played uh, Hammond B3. Okay. And his name was Joel Brooks. And he was brilliant. Like Jimmy Smith, a young kid, Jimmy Smith. So it was just drums, me and him on organ. And his uncle owned a, uh, a little nightclub called the Ambassador Lounge mm-hmm. on the north side of Kalamazoo, the black side of Kalamazoo. So we can go in the, in the ambassador lounge and be the opening act because his uncle owned the place before Jim McGriff or whoever's coming through town was gonna, gonna play. What? So it was, yes. So it was like first hand experience playing, ching, 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 or where we were, we were gonna play before they came on. And you know, it was that was just mind blowing. Cause I must tell you also, a part of what I what I love is a record by a cat named Jimmy Smith called The Sermon is 22 minutes long. Mm-hmm. And what's and what it did to my brain is E equals MC square. Art Blakey played a backbeat, two and four, the whole record. And because you know most cats, jazz guys are busy. No, but do do It just rocks like a, like a like a blues record. Mm-hmm. So I realized the power of that. And that really helped me a lot that you could just put it down and it's, and people love it even more. So man, those experiences when I was 11 with the ambassadors, that helped me, that band. And then we bring a little horn player into it, you know, captain who's studying at the, at the university on trumpet, Pierre or a sax player or a vice player, Carl, you know, going to expand the sound. So I had great experience playing the young like that. And then uh, I would do the, then the rock thing on my own bands. And then as I got a little older, I left home when I was about 16 years old. Right. And I had, I'd, I'd go to keyboards. I played Fender bass, organ, and we do like What Does It Take by Junior Walker All Stars, those type of songs. But I'm playing mm-hmm. keyboards now. So, and then that band was called Distance in the Far. Then I had another band I played bass. That's called The Mother Thump of the Flunkies. Now we're doing Expressway to Your Heart and, and Grand Funk Railroad, you know? Uh, Are You Ready? All that right. music. Yeah. So, and then before I left Kalamazoo, I, got, I joined a horn band, like kind of a Chicago horn band, but very progressive called Avatar. And they were really, really like probably the most progressive band I'd been with. And then my friend who played trouble with that band, Bobby Knapp, he said, do you know about this record um, by Cold Blood called Sisyphus? I said, no. He played me this cat man named Sandy McGee on an album called Sisyphus. And, it, and it, to this day, you say North Star moment. That's still my, that's still my North Star moment, Sandy McGee on drums. Wow. wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what is the, when's the moment in which you're like, okay, 
this is my profession. I am going to be a drummer. Always. I didn't want to do ever do anything else. I remember one day I had joined a band called Dick and William Soul Revival that came to Kalamazoo. They took me up after I, I didn't want to be in college anymore. I went three semesters of college. I packed my drums in their school bus and went out and played in Flint, Michigan, these little nasty joints. But it was so important that I did that because then I really knew how to connect with the people, 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 the people, people, people. And that was that same. And then my dad come back to Kalamazoo to go play some more clubs. And my dad would say, why don't you just become a policeman? You know, because this whole road thing for you. I don't know if you should be doing that. But no, no, I was always a drummer. Then that band decided to go out to California. Now here we are going out to California. I came out to California. You know, we played shows out here and, you know, in Hollywood and all that. They broke up. Then I decided, no, I want to stay in California. And then that became hard. Now I'm a shipping receiving clerk downtown LA, wrapping boxes here in music constantly. Just trying, how do I get out of here? You know, how do I save myself? And I had a few cousins, one that helped me out in the out in, uh, Inglewood area and another one out in Pasadena. He said, come stay with me. And I did. And then it's there that I could like really shed. Because now the Mobbish Workers album just, just came out. I had enough money to buy that Inner Mining Flame album. That just crushed me. I had never heard anything like a album Vishnu on that record. And seven, nine, eleven, whatever. What the hell? And Talk about funky it. like a fucking dog. Yeah. <laughs> God. So that became my, my shedding. Shed. And then I also love Buddy Miles, the live album. Da 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 so I kind of got off on mixing these worlds. The Cobb and Cleanless, Buddy Funk, and the Jackie Jeanette cymbals. Right. I loved all that stuff. Then I got, then I met this cat, man. You might know him. Um, Eddie Hazel. Ooh. Maggot Brown. You met Eddie Hazel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a band with him called Ouch. What? Wait, what? He was so mean because mean being good that he could play the funk really fast. That prepared me for, for Vishnu later. But he'd be like, look at that, look at that, look at that. And then you pass around this joint, but it'd be laced with PCP, the angel dust. So now you're really getting out there. But you know, you're looking at him because he's gorgeous, got his things on and gorgeous and just playing so clean, so fast. Aries. So those type of things happen for me, you know? What was Eddie Hazel experiences. like? Yeah. I, I need I need to hear what Eddie Hazel was like from a person yeah. not in the P Funk oh. atmosphere. Just um, a big, big, big brain. You know, like Hendrix, a big brain. You know, and not afraid of anything. The rock, the tone, the funk, the black. Like early Prince. Like a Prince could church. Like he was that. Could wow. do anything like in those worlds and not not scared of anything. And, and again, this powerful, this powerful, this powerful thing that would go around would be like, oh my God. I almost can't mess with that because I'm, I'm, too, I'm too sensitive but it would just make you feel like, whoa, you know? So Eddie Hazel was a, was, a, was an influence. I didn't stay with him very long, you know, because he was always moving, but you know, but he made a big influence on my life. You know, you hear Maggot Brains, that, how he plays on that record. It's like, you, that's who he is. I would like to know at what point did the the teachings of um, Sri uh, Chimoy enter your life? Like, was it during this period or was it later on? Just, how are after, you just after this period. This is my Pasadena, L.A. experience I'm talking about. Right. You know, and then I had to work hard to try to find work out in L.A., you know, very hard. And they even go back into being in what's called a, you know, an orderly in hospitals to, to, to make ends meet. But it wasn't long after I got a phone call from Miami, a cat down there named Santa Toronto, guitar player from Edgar, Edgar Winter Band down there, Santa Toronto. He thought he heard about me. He said, come down to Miami. So he bought my, my first plane ticket. I'd never been on a plane before. What you this? It'd be, it'd be maybe 71, 72, 71. Oh, gotcha. Right See, because I graduated high school 70. Gotcha. So that's now the year you're born, 71, around that area. 71. Then I flew to Miami and I liked Miami and it really opened my eyes up again because I got at the university. I wasn't at the university, but at the university, it would be all these great cats coming up. Pat Matheny, you know, Danny Gottlieb, Hiram Bullock, Cliff Carter, Patty Scalpel, who's now married to Bruce Springsteen. There are, there are all these young people like that. But my friend was one of the teachers named Stan Samoli. And I stayed with him. And he'd have books on the guru. I said, oh, okay. I said, this is the cat who's inspiring my vision. He said, yes. So then he started reading the books of poetry on Sri Sri Chinmoy that were inspiring 
Mahavishnu, the poems of Birds of Fire, you know, My Flute and Immortality, all these things he was writing that were just beautiful and very God-ordained. So then I joined up, I had a band down there called the New McGuire Sisters. Now we really went full-fledged rock, fusion, out there, odd meters to the limit. Because now Mahavishnu Orchestra made it go there. Mm -hmm. And we'd have this big warehouse where the sound would just be like enormous. Like I could mic my bass drum with a big SVT amplifier. So, be like... so I got used to just making this huge sound in there. And then not long after we got all this together, that band then moved to Connecticut, a place called Canaan, Connecticut, way up on the border of Massachusetts and Connecticut, a farm, mm -hmm. a barn where we could play. It was an awesome, awesome sound. And then a little cabins in a main, a main house. And so we could keep kept working, but I was always scratching. How am I going to make it, brother? How am I going to make it? How am I going to make it? That was always on my soul. And then not long after came through, came through Hartford, the Mobbish Norkers, second album playing the birds of fire. And I had my friend, our manager, take me down to that show and drop me off at the, at the show. And what, this is really important because you asked about guru. Yes. It was my first time laying eyes on the real living Mahavishnu and Cobham. And as I'm getting there, I'm a bit late. The um, place is packed. There's a bright light on Vishnu. And it's just him on double neck guitar and Cobham going at it. Um, Maybe in 17, something so out there you would never, you can't even count it. But they were like so intense with it. It was just nuts. So I decided to walk right down to the edge of the stage and look up in his eyes and see what the hell is going on. And I did. And I looked right up in his eyes and he's he's just the bullets, just bullets. <laughs> just like an animal on fire. And his eyes are back in his head. And I go, God, this is real. It's it's too intense to be made to me to be like memorized. It's just flowing through him. And it went on for so long. I could have been like 20 minutes of this. You know, I heard John Coltrane on record with Elvin Jones just be out there for the longest times. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything live in a rock setting. Marshalls, Fives drum set, loud, clean. Oh, fives, oh my God. Clear Fives, loud, clean. It could stop like that. And back at it <laughs> together mm. oh holy god this is this this is now my life this is now got to be what i got to go to because if i if i do another direction in my life i could die i, I don't want to die like jimmy who are my 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 heroes right and i knew that that that, that vishnu was into god he would found the meditation way because i knew about his guru so that night i saw a guy in white i knew his disciple his name was Apeksha. I said, please, Apeksha, I really have to meet Mahavishnu. Take him back to meet him. And he was so kind to me. Out of the whole audience, I'm, some, I'm nobody. He gets me backstage. And Mahavishnu pokes his head out and said, go in that little room and I'll meet you in one minute. And I wait in that little tiny room. And I'm scared. Because I've never seen anything like this. And I can hear Cobb and Jan Hammer, you know, high talk in the other room like, McCoy Tyner, da, 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 you know, and then Jan Jones, da, 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 and they're all ah. damn. I'm high, like just out there, talk. And then Mahavishnu comes in and he's like, English with this black mob Miles Davis talk. Hello, my brother, how are you? Kind of, you know, just it's like, what is that? But that's how he was. And I said, Well, my name is Michael Walls, and I said, I've never seen anything like you, and I want to be like you. I play drums. And he said, uh, well, you know, what I'm doing is largely due to my prayer life, my meditation life. I said, yeah, I know, because I read on the back of your jackets these the poems by your guru. He said, yeah, he said, I'm going to see my guru at six in the morning. And I'll tell him I met you. Now, even that was like, bam. Here we are mm -hmm. backstage in Hartford. It's almost one in the morning. He would drive all night, go back to Queens, New York, and see the guru at 6 a.m. That's not, he's, right. he's not going to sleep after just what I saw him do. Something so small like that just rocked my <laughs> world. This is, this is, 
this is too much. And you know what happened? It's just God. Because about a week later, I'm way out in the country of Hayden, Connecticut, in the woods at this farm I lived in. And the phone rings. And it's Mahavishnu. He says, hi, man, it's Mahavishnu. And I can't be there tonight, but I want you to go to the meditation in uh, Norwalk and meet the guru tonight. I said, okay. So, man, I, I, I had long hair. I brushed my hair back. You know, <laughs> and I got my, my shaver and I shaved my beard off because I know they didn't, they didn't have no beards. And my mom had made me a kind of a white dashiki. I put that white dashiki on and, I, and, I, and we had an old limousine that the new McGuire sisters had. And my friend Greg Feld drove me down there. And you know what? And when I got there, that was, I was a little bit late too. So guess what happened? I go inside and I lay my eyes on the guru. There he is singing, playing the harmonium and singing. And he, he sees me, he keeps singing. And the girls are on one side, and the boys are on the other side. They're all wearing white, and the girls are all wearing these kind of Indian saris. So there's one chair left on the girls' side. So I sit down with the girls. And then this old lady named Akuti, she gets up front, and she reads out of his new book called The Dance of Life Part Two. And the poems in this book were just like knives in my heart because, uh, you know, it was just, just crying to God. You know, oh Lord, how many days, how many nights, how many minutes, seconds, hours must I cry to see your face? You know, how 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 long must I, you know, you know, wait, wait to see you? It go on and on like that. And then it hit me again. Maybe what you're asking for, Michael. I was my I wasn't an art, I was Michael. Maybe what you're asking for, you're not really ready for. That's what hit me again. Then I met a black gentleman just after this whole thing named Lelehan. He's all high. Hey, hey, hey. Let's go upstairs to the library. You know, we buy, buy, buy a book and then I can take you to the, to, the, uh, to the restaurant called Love and Serve. Okay. So I go up to the library and all these books he had written. I have just enough money to buy a book called The Dance of the Black Part Two that they had read, that downstairs they had read from. So I buy that one book and as I'm walking down the stairs, man, here is the guru in the living room, just standing there, kind of meditating. And I, so, so I stop. And he says, so you are Mahavishnu's friend? I said, yes. He said, you would, like, you would like to become my disciple? I said, I think I'm ready. And he went into a long meditation, like, like it just saw Mahavishnu, the eyes went back in his head. And just this feeling came over me as I stood before him. And then not long after he said, I accept you within my heart. And then he kind of walked away. But as he walked away, I kind of felt like an explosion happening inside of me. And um, maybe an explosion of gratitude that now I've, now I've met my Vishnu. I've, now I'm meeting his guru. His guru has just accepted me. Who am I? That's what happened to me. And I was so grateful that it'd be, to be accepted. And I knew that would save my life because I did not want to die. I'm the kind of cat, LSD, Love the experience of being so high, but you can have a bad experience and be out of here. Or Eddie's PSPs and the angel dusts and those things can just get you out of here, man. So here, this is the God way. You just love God. You know, you pray, you meditate. You know, you 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 do beautiful things and you offer your music to God. That changed ask... the whole trick I tricked in my life. All right, let me ask you something because yeah. it took me... <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I appreciate you sharing that. But the thing is, because the thing is, is that it might have it might have taken me about five decades to even be open to that level of spirituality, because you know, for a lot of African Americans in America, like we clutch onto our Christianity like no one's business. And any other kind of straying from, you know, what your grandmom taught you, what her grandmother taught her, what, and so on and so forth, back to, our, you know, our, our presence in this country is often frowned upon amongst other Black people. But, what, like, just what made you open at that time? Because even, like, I remember... Uh, uh, seeing an interview 
uh, with like Maurice White of Earth, Wind and Fire, maybe in like in the late seventies, early eighties, where he's talking about this level of spirituality yes. and kind of looking at the adults in the room as he's saying this on television. They're frowning like, mm -mm, "See, that's that <laughs> devil shit." He, he ain't talking about Christianity. Da da da. So, like, what made you? Because this is not. Even though this this level of spirituality is our African origins, yes. What made you just sort of bypass the the fear of what will others think about me, or what will my parents say, or what will my fellow Michigan's people or fellow Black people they think like I'm this weird? Like, what made you just bypass that? I wanted to save my life. It was just me against the world. It's just me against the world. How am I going to make it? This is the way to make it, Narada. Mahavishnu has accepted you as a friend. He's calling on the phone. This is his guru. His guru has accepted you. It felt good to me. It was a way of, 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 of living a good life, of having a way of directing my attention, my, my focus. And I needed that. I know. I knew I needed it. I was raised Catholic. I was raised with Mother Mary, Jesus, uh, mm -hmm. all that, and the Holy Communion, and all that. I know all those things. You know, the, the Angustay and the sanctuary, and all the beautiful music. But, but that wasn't saving me. Okay. What that wasn't that? saving me. And and I had been clobbered by Mahavishnu live. Not only, you know, unspoken heights, live. I see. And then to meet his teacher, he was beautiful. There was nothing wrong. It was like, okay, would you follow Jesus? Yeah. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a living example of someone living truth, talking truth. What you gonna do? So for me, it was a blessing, absolute blessing. There was no doubt about that at all. Only doubt was, am I am I good enough? Am I ready enough? Like I told you. When did you? When did he grant you with the name Narada? And well, that the... came later. He told me later. So I'm gonna I'm not, I'm not gonna spoil you. I've, I've spoiled so many, giving them names too fast. <laughs> or too early. I'm not going to spoil you. I'm going to make you wait. And it wasn't until the release of Garden of Love Light ah. that he gave me my name, Narda. And he said, No, Ra, Da, Na, Ra. That went on for so long. I don't know if my name was Na, Ra, or Da. <laughs> so he said, Narda. He said, Narda's a supreme musician. Narda's soul brings from heaven to earth light, delight, and compassion and takes back to heaven from earth, earth's sufferings. So mm -hmm. the music, this is my role now as Narda Michael Walden. And uh, so what, yeah. What leads what leads to your deal at Atlantic Records? And on top of that, how did you link with of all people Tom Dowd on yeah. your first album? I went through after I joined My Vision Orchestra and did like two and a half years with My Vision Orchestra, when that band stopped and Vishnu then went to Shakti with, you know, Zakir Hussein and that genius stuff. Then I was really in a, in a funk and a depression because now I didn't know what to do with my life. I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm high now. Now my chops, everything is, but what are you going to do? You're not in a band anymore. It's like the Beatles broke up. <laughs> so uh, I just tried to think of what I was going to do. I became a, a teacher for a while at the, that downtown, uh, the, 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 the drum workshop, the teacher's thing, where, the, where was it called? Someplace I played, taught, taught down there for a while. Anyway, I'm saying to you, I just had to focus. And I thought, well, let's just go on my solo career. So then my attorney was Barry Platt. And he said, you know what? Epic Records will pay for you to make a demo. You know, because at least you got some name from coming from obvious Orchestra. I said, okay. So then I heard off Lenny White's album, uh, Phoenician Summers, this cat named Raymond Gomez, who I thought, damn, this guy has got the chops like I'm wanting to hear. And then when I met him, he had the both sides, like Hendrix Blues with chops and, and fusionary. So I said, okay, I, I want you, would you play make my make my demo with me? And David Sanchez, who had made his album, him on keyboards, and then a guy like Will Lee was David's bass player at the time. So then I went to Epic and made Sun is Dancing, maybe Delightful and one, one, one of the songs. Maybe, or maybe the, maybe Delightful and one of the songs. Three, three things. And the Epic turned it down. So then walk on the streets thinking, how are you gonna make it? How are you gonna make it? How are you gonna make it? And then Barry said, just you know, stay patient. And I got a phone call from a cat named Raymond Silva from Atlantic. They were doing well with now Cobham. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, uh, you know, maybe we'd be interested in you. So then I gave him my tape that I'd done for the epic of the Senna's dancing and maybe with a few things I'd cut. 
And I met Jared Greenberg, who was a president at the time. And then they offered me a deal. But guess what? They said, we want half your publishing. I said, okay. I wanted to deal that bad. I had, I was doing well with Wired. I wrote four songs on Wired for Jeff Beck, so I'm making money. Mm -hmm. So then they said, we want half the publishing. I said, no, I don't care. Just sign me. Give me a shot. And they did. And then they said, you have your choice of two producers, in-house producers, Arif Mardin or Tommy Dowd. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I love them both, but this album is more on the rock side. And I want to use this engineer from London who did the last... My vision album called Inner Worlds named Dennis McKay. Right. So I thought maybe I should use Tommy Tommy mm -hmm. Dowd because he's more on that side of things. And I did. Tommy said, hey, let's work. And Tommy was so cool. And he just um, let me be me and help me. And, and I was in that studio, brother, where Aretha and Ray and all that, that's where I cut Garden Love and that main studio. And it'd be, on, uh, I want to say another cat was there is Jimmy Douglas, a young backup oh, yeah. cat. Yeah. He was my... Yeah. He was the, the the second. So it'd be him and Des McKay and Tommy Tommy Dowd and my hot band of Raymond Gomez, David Sanchez, Will Lee on bass, and myself. That was the core. I did a little rehearsal for it so they'd know what, what to expect in the studio. So we could cut it fast, because you know, as you know, studio time and all that's expensive. Time is money, yeah. So we went in there knowing I knew White Knight. Ray and I wrote that and we knew how to do it. I brought in a great arranger named Michael Gibbs, who did the Apocalypse album, Mom Vishnu, because he was brilliant to arrange my strings when I wanted that. And um, then my friends came, like Carlos Santana came to do the thing called First Love, which is beautiful. Yeah. Jeff Beck came to do Satan the Rascal, which is beautiful. So I'm just really honored by that album. Um, and I'm glad that you know about it because some people don't even know about it, but that was my first solo album, my baby. There's a question I've been dying to know. Okay. Now, and you're not the only one. In, in the mid seventies, jazz cats, who now in the case if you're Miles Davis disciple, I understand. Like M2 may already explained to us that Miles's dependency uh was getting out of control in the early 70s. And, and then he's basically not too functional. And the band's left without work. And they're basically like, well, we gotta pay the rent. And you know, M M2 May and Reggie Lucas of Miles mm -hmm. Davis's uh, you know. Band were like, well, shit, we got to write some hits to pay the bills. Yeah. Can you explain to me why there was such a mass exodus of fusion musicians, mm -hmm. of jazz musicians, that all of a sudden in the mid 70s became the architects and the proprietors of some of the poppiest songs we've ever heard? It's almost <laughs> like a complete opposite. It, what's really weird is that um, because we had the Garden of Light and Love A-track, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I really wasn't familiar with you physically because on the A-track, even though you're standing there, <laughs> you know, you're small. Yeah. And so pretty much, I, th I think the first time I physically saw you was when you were doing your first rounds on uh, American Bandstand, Soul Train. You know, doing I should have loved you and I don't want nobody else to dance with you. So what was the transitional decision process to get out of fusion and into pop music? Very good. I got you. On my third solo album, on my third solo album, we call Awakening. I was cutting right. I was cutting it in LA. Uh Stevie Wonder Studio. And Wayne Anderson was one of the producer type people with me and his teams and all that. And then I got a call after I was cutting that music, you know, uh, some cool stuff that um, Jim Delahant from Atlantic, who's my a &R, he said, you know what? If you don't have a hit on this next album, we're going to drop you. And that was the word of death to me. And, and um, I knew that things were going through a change. He, he told me, he said, in New York, disco's hot now, dancing. Uh, the Studio 54, people are really, it's like a big craze. We really suggest that you come to New York and see what's going on. And I did. And when I went there, I felt what he was talking about. It was on fire with dance. And that wasn't hard for me because I'm raised with Motown. I'm raised with people, all kinds of music. So after I got the awakening stuff in, in California, I decided I'd make a side, side one, 
that was strictly for dance and save my career and not be dropped. And I used the examples of Rick James, you and I. He was a good person for me to kind of draw from because it was live drums, it was funky, it was live, it was horns, things I loved. Mm -hmm. And it was a style I could, I could pull off. So in my hotel room at the Hilton, in my, I got a clavinet and a Rhodes in my room and I wrote four jams and I don't know what else was one of those jams. And I was so lucky to get Bobby Claremont from Power Station to be my, my engineer. What records he made with Sheik on Good Times. I had never heard a more beautiful record than fucking Good Times. <laughs> and to have him be my engineer to do my drum sound. Yeah. See? So I'm cutting those records. I don't want anybody else. And then guess what else? Now I got Randy Brecker coming, coming with Michael Brecker and David Sandler put on my jam. So it's real musicians. See, I'm happy. And then they said, he was a cat who's big in disco named Patrick. Um, Patrick Adams. Yes. Because yeah. his name in the disco world, with the strings and looking he does, P &P records, will, yeah. will make sure you, you know. So I said, okay. So I'm, you know, and he didn't come around that, that much, but he might come out and like, put a little sound on something, do a little thing, a little, you know, he was cool. What I'm saying is cutting that music. And then when I had success with that sound, it saved my career at that time. I didn't want to be dropped. I wanted to be a strong person and make it. I just got married. I wanted to take care of my life. And fusionary music, as we know it, was going away. The people and the fans, for example, Garden Love Light. That album didn't sell that much. I wasn't, I wasn't like some overnight star. People weren't, they, they were not, they were not supporting what they supposedly loved a fusion at those times going forward in the 70s. Early on, yes, but not those years. Those years there was a change up going on. Even even Lenny White with my man Return to Forever. Those Everybody's kind of like, mm. nah, nah, nah. right? So, what are you, what are you gonna do? You know what I mean? If you're gonna support me, fine. We're making money. No money. I'm, I'm going where I'm going to save my life. And I did, brother. I got. I'm, you. I'm happy. I did. It was wonderful. I wonderful. got. You. And I, and every album I do, I always put, you know, a son is dancing type jam on there. Mm -hmm. Show sure, mm -hmm. I can still do that, and I love it. Right. But I, but I'm about having a radio hit and making some money, so I'm not shining shoes. So answer this. All this time. I could have sworn, because uh, uh, I, I know that you've had Randy Jackson in your stable since he was a teenager, and not Michael's brother, but Randy Jackson, American Idol Randy Jackson, since he was 16, 17, 18 years old, I believe. But I always thought that was him killing I Should Have Loved You. Someone told me like two weeks ago that was T.M. Stevens. That's right. That's can, you yeah, please, can you please tell me just about T.M. Stevens, and because that's a cat. Unfortunately, I got to meet him a little bit too late, and in his present condition, he's not able to, you know, with the motor skills to, you know, to communicate all the things I want to know. What, tell me what it was like working with him. T.M.'s a genius. I was in New York. I still lived in New York. I met T.M. before I moved to California in 78. So in 77, around those years, I, I met to him, you know, he'd be like the Stevie Wonder of the bass. He had that kind of power, that kind of energy, like a like just a, a huge man with the, the strength of God in his hands. And he could play like that. He could be popping the, the two and the four as he's playing with lines. Right. And just, he was playing with a, a, a show called Your Arms Too Short to Box with God. And he yeah. had a drummer named Howie Great from Queens. And Howie became my connection out in the Queens area. All those great drummers out and people out in Queens area too, see? So now here's TM Steve. I mean, all these new cats are coming up with the, with the great skills. And then as it worked out, um, I had to do a tour. For I don't know how to dance with you. So I had to put a band together. So I asked TM to join my, my touring band, you know, and Philippe Sace out of Berkeley to play keyboards and Pat Thrall from Automatic Man from California come play guitars and put a hot band together and toured. And then... Came time for the for the, my fourth solo album, which comes Dance of Life. And now I'm living in San Francisco. So I thought I'll bring TM Stevens out here to work out this new material with me. And I know I still have to have another hit, or I'll be dropped. So as it worked out, I brought him to California. We had a little warehouse in Oakland. I said, TM, I'm gonna play a game with you. I'm gonna play this groove on the drums. And every time I hit the I hit the cymbal, change bass lines. So I played. And he'd be playing the bass line, whatever it is, right? And then I crack the cymbal again. He changed. I crack the cymbal again. He changed. Then finally, crack. 
Shit up, dog. The ideas came to me. Shit up. That was TM. That's his massive bass line. Randy yeah. Jackson wasn't around then. That came, he came later. I get it. Like, I didn't I think I'd get ever find anyone who could play. I should have loved you like TM Stevens. He's the most massive cat in the world. For the longest, I thought it was when, you know, it, it came out when I was eight. So I thought it was chic initially. Yeah. But yeah, man. I And also, um, shit, I'm just realizing now, before she passed away, uh, we had Allie Willis on the show. Yes. And she was just mind blown that we knew her whole discography only because um, a lot of the work that she did wound up being like iconic samples that we would later gravitate towards. And so she was kind of weirded out that we like knew her history. But um, how did you link up with her to write that song? Well, it's, okay, she's in L.A. I'm in San Francisco. And I hear about her work because of the Maurice White Earth and the Fire stuff that was exploding with her name on it. Right, okay. I knew I knew she was mean. Somehow or other in touch with her because of her publishing people, her, the, the company she was part of, Alma Irving. And I could find her number. Then when I talked on the phone, Come to find out she's from damn my hometown, Detroit, Michigan. I'm from Kalamazoo. She's from Detroit. So we had a kind of a bond immediately. And that I love what she was doing. She said, well, come down to my house. So I did. I brought my I should love you down to her house. And her house was all, what's that word when everything's like old fashioned looking? Old dolls and old things and old, yeah, everything yeah, old. Yeah, that's you know, name yeah we, we've been to her crib before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was kind of, wow, okay. But we sat down and wrote the lyrics for I should love you. And she was just mean. How her brain thought, you know. Um, okay, that's so. Yeah. Wait, she she's had that house of kitsch art. There was crazy two. Art. No, there's two. It was first house she had was a kind of smaller apartment house. It, okay. wasn't, it wasn't the big one. It was smaller, but it had all that stuff in it. Then later on, as we became even closer and friendlier over the over the years, then she got the bigger house that you bought. Yeah, yeah for, we, for, we were always tight then too. For those listening, um, Allie Willis, who uh, we got to know once. The, uh, the 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 debate of September, Earth, Wind, and Fire. September um, kind of came into play once Taylor Swift covered it, and she wound up coming on the show, Allie Willis, and she later invited us to her house. And you know, pretty much, if you're familiar with Pee Wee's Playhouse, it's it's damn near a replica. Like she has the most kitsch art, the weirdest yeah, co great. collection <laughs> of art ever. Oh, wait, I, I will just say, because I really want to get into your production stuff. Also, I I, th I think it's a crime that the the confidence record really didn't really didn't uh uh kind of push you further into the spotlight, which actually I want to know into your transition of producing, how did how did that happen? Um, because the first time that I got familiar with you, of course. Uh, I think the first time I saw your name as a producer was, I think, like Stacy Lattisall's work. That's it. That's my first hit. Uh, Let Me Be Your Angel. Dynamite Jump to the Beat, that album. Let Me Be Your Angel. T tell me about the process of of going into producing and what did, you, what did you learn? What did you learn that you couldn't apply for yourself that you wound up giving to other artists? Well, at that time, I was hot with I Should Have Loved You, Time All Right, those records, Why'd You Turn Me On? And I asked Henry Allen, who was the president of Cotillion Records, he's a partner with Atlantic Records, black gentleman, Henry Allen. You got to know about Henry Allen. He, okay. and, he and his team, they had signed Stacy when she was about 11. And um, they had made a recording, but it wasn't doing well. So I said, Henry, you know, this girl, Stacy, why don't you let me do some songs on her? I'll do four songs. If you like them, I'll finish the album. If you don't like them, you haven't lost much as four songs. And he said, you know what? It's a good idea. Go on, do do her. So I took it very, very seriously. This is my first real shot at pop production. My my first jazz production was just before that. A cat named Don Cherry. The now I'm called oh, Serena yeah. Rose. More jazz, you know, with Tony Williams and Lenny, all that stuff. Sure. But in the, in the pop world, yes, it was Stacy Ladazal. So then I I wrote these songs with a girl named Bunny Hall. Bunny came to my house in San Francisco, and my wife at the time, Lisa Lisa Walden. Mm -hmm. I wrote these songs, Let Me Be Your Angel, um, Dynamite, Jump to the Beat. And 
I then I flew to go to Stacy's house. She had a very small house and like a little spin-up piano. And I just got on her piano and just kind of went through these teach, teaching her the songs. So make sure the keys are right and all that. And then came back to San Francisco at the Sausalito record plant where Prince then made his, his first album. In there, I got my big drum sound. Um, Tommy, Tommy Fly, the same guy that did Rick James's records. I'm going to be an angel. Dynamite got a great sound with my band, Corrado on guitar, TM on bass. Frank Martin on keyboards and laid that stuff out. Mike Gibbs strings laid it out, then went to power station to get her vocals on those songs. And here she's about 11 years old, that big voice you hear. And just, I wanted to get it just right. And we did. And it became hits for us. So I was just very, 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 very proud of that time. And it opened up a lot of doors for me because, because of that came then Clive Davis calling and everybody else calling because I had that kind of success with Stacey. And the Stacey actually went on to open for Michael Jackson and Jackson 5. That's how big, big she got, man. With T.M. Okay. Steven on bass. I was going to ask, uh, with that work with Stacey and then also going on with Shanice and Tevin Campbell, what was kind of your, I guess, your, your formula for working with children? Because that's something that's really hard to do, like to write material that is, you know, is that's, you know, it can sell, but it's also is age appropriate. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. How did you kind of figure that out and, you know, and, and kind of find that balance? You have to have a great hook. The hook is where, it's, where it's, it's, it will always save you as far as making money in a music business, the hook, the chorus. And I'm always aware of like, well, who is it? it Stacy, she's 11, 12. This whole angel concept is always cool, you know? And then she could talk, you know, you, you know, you might think I'm too young to understand, but don't be fooled, you know, like a child, you know, I look into your eyes and I know someday, you know, I'll make you mine. Oh. Uh, so you gotta, you, I don't make kitty music. That doesn't work. I learned from Michael Jackson the early, I want you back. Mm -hmm. You know, those records, you gotta make records that everyone can party to, to have hits. So I didn't try to make kitty records. You mentioned Shawnee's Wilson. She came here, she was 16. And I said, write down seven song titles. And she did, just <laughs> I hate to be lonely, I love your smile. Da -da 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 and I went on my keyboard and just wrote those songs. And I wow. God bless me. Just I love I love your smile. Just looking at her. You could feel the energy coming off her and that smile she's got. <laughs> That's what it was. Tevin Campbell, when Quincy Jones brought him here, I looked at him. Mm -hmm. Just so beautiful, thin, a genius singer like Whitney. So, well, you need you need a song to showcase your voice, you know, like a, song, a, a, a tour de force, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, said, I said, "What you what you want to do, Tevin? Tell me what you want me to do. Yeah, tell me what you want me to do. That, that's how they just that, that's simple, <laughs> you know. And then you got to put the big modulation so you can really go off. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> 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 Jimmy Jam kind of teases me because when I was a kid, whenever a song would modulate, that would scare yeah. me. Okay, and so because <laughs> it sounds dramatic. Yeah. And so, wait, but here's the thing. You, you know, often in my obsession with historical firsts. Yeah. I will actually say that if someone were to be credited with like the really first attempt at New Jack Swing. Yeah. I, I would say Attack of the Name game might be the first experimentation of making a singer sing on a backtrack that is that could be made for hip hop. Um, could you? All right. So for those that don't know, um, was it the Sneaking Out album? Yeah. Yeah. So Stacey Lattisall's, I think, well, I know she had albums before mm -hmm. Let Me Be Your Angel. So yeah. I would say her fourth album, maybe her third or fourth album. Um, but there's a song, Attack of the Name Game, which even when I heard it as an 11 year old, I was like, oh, this is kind of made for me. Like, mm -hmm. this, this isn't a song that my dad would gravitate towards because this sounds like rap music that I like. What, what was the process in trying to go there? Thank you. That's very cool, man. Attack of the Name Game, um, two things. One, Borrowing from that 60s uh, idea of, you know, ba banana fan, a faux fan, of me and my mom, man, taking that vibe, which I actually right. had to pay them for, which I didn't mind because I I, I love the concept. And then I joined that with- Wait, really? Of, 
Yes, I did. I did. And then I joined that with my brain and made my own version of Tom Tom Club, which was so hot in New York. <laughs> Tina, Tina, Tina. Oh, I, you're yeah, right. Yeah. See? Oh, I by the all, way. All those things and mix them together. Let me let the listeners know. Yeah, Attack of the Name game is what Mariah sampled for a uh, Heartbreaker. Heartbreaker. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. But so I was always looking to New York and and even London too. What was always going to be the next wave. So I caught that wave, man. Uh, and I'm just, you know, and then I got Stacy to do the, the thing. Wonderful. And her brother became that kind of a sound talking like the, the alien from outer oh, space. See, I thought that, that was you. <laughs> that, that was her brother. Ah, nice. Okay. Yeah. If there's two human beings that I've seen that were otherworldly to me, as far as like, they're just on some almost Pleiadian alien level type of person. I've never seen Angela Bofield give a normal interview on television. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> can you please describe, because I just need, I've never seen a, a person put their humor out front and like she she always had a joke or a punchline like maybe vesta is in third place like I, i'll say tata vega vesta and angela bofield were like almost personalities what was it like what was angela bofield like um open-hearted funny but i must tell you perfect pitch it's so beautiful how she hears and how she can hit her notes and just make everything so musical. She's extremely musical. I was a fan of her stuff, you know, before I ever worked with her, you know. Uh, I try, and those records she put out was they were with, with Grus and Dave Grus and was just beautiful. So then when Clive Dave asked me to work with, with Angela, he first picked the song of um, Something About You and a few of those type of ideas. But it, mm -hmm. what, what, after I got to know her, I know that she liked the funk, see? Then I got excited and I came on one morning on my profit keyboard and my drum machine, my limb machines, and just made a demo. But I don't make demos, I make records. But cut I cut an idea of too tough for her. Because I knew that she liked the funk. And that was the most cutting edge of the best stuff I could do at that time. And I said, Angela, just come in and just sing on this for me. And she did. And she got so excited, she called Clive. Narda gave me a hit. But I was really just wanting to be like raw. A doom doom doom. Doom doom doom. <laughs> like the, all that kind of thing you know and and we all we also had a little license to be a little, little raunchy in lyrics now because now prince has been on the scene a lot of things have been on the scene you could be a little bit cutting edge on the lyric in r&b and get away with it so all those things kind of came into factor but i love oh. van you know she's had a little stroke now we're still yeah. talking and all she's all wanting to know what's going on you know but um we made i made three albums for langela bova three albums a lot of music Oh, and she taught me how to then go into Whitney Houston. I have to say that. My dis wow. my discipline with with, with Angela gave me knowing how to, if I only had three hours with her, with, with the, Whitney, three hours here, three hours there, two hours here, I knew how to cut vocals now because of Angela Bofield. So before we get to Whitney. Yeah. One, <laughs> I want to know, like, how do you climb the mountain that is Clive Davis? Because to me, because of his just no nonsense, no bullshit kind of like, give me the hit, take me to the mountaintop. How how do you, like, what is what is your first meetings with Clive like? Like, how does he know that he can put his trust in you to deliver what is needed? I think when he heard, let me be your angel, he called me on the telephone and he said, you know, how are you doing this? It was like a question to me. It's like, huh? How am I doing this? I said, well, I'm from Michigan. Callum is in Michigan. We love music, and we uh, we we just that's what we do. Said, that's that's it. I said, for me. He goes, well, how would you want to work with some of my artists, like Angela Bofield? That's how it started. Just that's that humble, and mm. and then after I did the trust with Angela, doing those records, came then Phyllis Hyman. Mm. And uh, then, then not long after that, he said, Dion Warwick. That's, that's mm -hmm. my, you know, Burt Backrex, Hal David. It's like, oh my God, Alfie, you know, the Windows of the World, all that music. 
So that was mind blowing to even think about meeting Dion Di Warren. I put my little 13 songs together, went to LA to her home and Dion was not feeling my music. So I came back home and I called all clock. Dion is not feeling my music. He said, don't worry, which I thought was very, very kind. He said, don't worry. He said, how about Aretha Franklin? How about Aretha Franklin? <laughs> right. He said, just give her a phone call. Okay. And I did. And I called Aretha. And I'm so glad I had my pen and paper and everything ready because I had no idea how deep she is. Can I, can I, can I tell that story for you right now? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yes. I call Aretha. He, she says, hi. And I said, well, what, what do you do for fun? You know, I'm just trying to break it down. You know, you're in Detroit. What do you, what do you do for fun? And that's when she showed me who she is. She goes, hmm. You know, maybe at night I go out to a nightclub. You know, maybe in the corner I see a guy like, you know, he looks, he looks at me. I look at him. It's like, who's zooming me? <laughs> then he feels, then he feels he's got me with a fish chip off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> who's zooming who? The fish jump off the hook. That's how she talked. That's who wow. she is. I was like, so that was, I wasn't ready for all that. But I took that stuff, I was like, Preston Glass, my, my partner, we got to write a song with this who's zooming who, fish jump off the hook. <laughs> she's, she's crazy, man. She's crazy. <laughs> That's how that happened. So that was Clyde Davis. He said, just give her a call. So no, no one goes, no one, I mean, yes, I, I believe that you can meditate and manifest whatever it is that you want to achieve in life. Yeah. But I mean, to be honest with you, when you're starting the Whitney Houston debut album, I mean, are you thinking that this person's about to be the Mount Rushmore of pop music as we know it at that time? Or were they just planning like respectable, you know, uh, black Kashif numbers? Like she's going to go gold and platinum, maybe double platinum. Like come to the door, do you know what you guys were gunning for? Okay, I, that's very beautiful. Thank you for the honor and the love you're giving me. I can feel it when you're talking to me. And what it does is it makes me really think about what you're asking. So what I, what I want to say is this. When I'm in the Automat, I wasn't at Tarpan Studios yet. I was still in the city at the Automat, cutting Aretha Franklin, getting ready for Aretha Franklin. When the phone call came from Jerry Griffith, the a r of Arista. Narda, you got to make time for Whitney Houston. And I said, no. I'm working on Aretha Franklin. I cannot lose my focus. He goes, yeah, I know but you don't want to miss this young girl we've signed who's going to be big. But, and also I got to tell you, Narda, she is Sissy Houston's daughter. And then I had to stop and think, Sissy Houston's saying background on Garden Love Light. Take me, take me, take me, take me to the Garden Love Light. And over right. the corner was a little 11 year old girl. That was the, her daughter. I met this little girl, she was 11. I go, oh, yeah. I said, well, you know, I'm busy. He goes, we have a hook, a song, How Will I Know? Let me just send you the idea. So he sent me the idea. I heard How Will I Know? How Will I Know? You know cool, cool chorus. I called him back. I said, Jerry, there's no verses. I mean, if I'm going to get involved, I got to write some verses for this thing. Finish it. It's going to make a, a strong song. Mm -hmm. He goes, let me ask the writers. He called the writers. Call me back. Writers say, fine. Now it's on. Yeah. So instead of doing another Aretha song that day, I told Randy Jackson, Corrado, Preston, Walter Alsanavia, Frank Martin, Dave Frazier, my team. We're going to do a song called How Will I Know for Whitney Houston today. And I just went to the piano and banged it out and put a verse. There's a boy, dun, 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 dun. I know, dun, dun. he's the one of that kind of spirit. And they cut the hell out of it. And that was the time. Now Randy's playing this Moog bass with one finger. So we had this team, this hybrid of like a Motown corporation sound with the newest technology that we needed to be competitive with Prince and Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, and everybody else who's doing records. So we put that thing down. Then I called Whitney the phone because I hadn't spoken to her yet. And I said, listen, I'm making the verse really high. Can you sing high? She goes, yeah, let's sing high. 
No, I said, no, 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 no. I'm cutting this in San Francisco. I'm going to fly to New York to go meet you with a tape. If it's the wrong key, we'll get, we're off. Yeah. She says, no, no, I can sing high. I said, all right. And then I went to New York. And when I go to New York at Media Sound with Michael Barbiero, with my engineer, okay, he was brilliant. He knew the right mic that I liked this. Neumann, beautiful mic. We're ready. We're in the studio making the, getting the, getting the, everything sounding good before she even walks in. And when she walked in, now I'm going to talk to you straight up. She was so beautiful. Just to put your eyes on her was just like, oh my God, now I'm understanding. We don't even heard her sing. Just looking at her. She's just, the cheekbones, the fingers, her, she was just, she was just, she was 19. Like, okay, okay, I'm starting to understand here now. But now, she, just, because our time is tight, go by the mic, sing the song. And God bless her, she knew that song. Of 20 songs I've done with her, that was the only song she knew. How long is she? She was ready for it. First mm -hmm. album. And she blew that song, man. She killed that song. Like what you're hearing on that record. All that power and spit and, da -da 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 -da, and also control of the head voice to the chest voice. The chest voice back to the head voice. It was all effortless. I said, well, you know what? We did about four or five takes of this and you're so tight on it. I don't need to keep beating this horse. What we're going to do now is do a few, a few harmonies and you want to come listen to it. And she doubled, I want her double. She harmonized, I want her. I said, come listen to it. On the playback in the control room, if you're me and I'm her, she's looking at me like this. She's looking at me like that. Uh -huh. I've never had anyone stare at me like that. The, the howling was blaring over the speakers, killing it. And she's looking at me like, do you hear that? <laughs> do you hear that? Now it's like a Muhammad Ali moment. Like, you know, I'm the greatest without saying that. Just like, <laughs> now I'm realizing, damn, this is incredible. <laughs> and I bless us, man. That's what I want to tell you. That's when it hit me that, yeah, now we're on to something that's going to be like huge. Go I ahead. have one question. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you do something on that song I've never heard in the history of pop music. I've never heard somebody... Like, because the thing is, you're building up drama. Like, go to the if he loves me, if he loves me not thing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That That is a ramp. You're building up to something. Yeah. And when you build up to it, you modulate to a lower key. I've never heard that in the history of pop music. What was the thought behind? Because, you know, again, modulation is supposed to be the dramatic moment oh, where uh, you get yeah. higher and, but yet. Like James Brown, funky good time almost. Like, it I need right. to get down, get down, beat. Down, beat. <laughs> you go lower. What was the? How did you know that would come off? Well, to be honest with you, before I even met Whitney, I work out the song in the studio, and maybe I even get like a, one of my singers, my girl singers, to come and just lay out the idea, so I know it all works before I even go anywhere. I have okay. a few different demo demo singers, but Kitty Beethoven at that time was one of my go tos to work out my ideas that it was all going to be like strong. That's what I always do, put make a blueprint so that when I get with a singer, if something doesn't work out, well, no, I know this work, please do this. So that's how I worked it out, knowing it would be great because it sounded great. And I put the backgrounds on it, the ideas, everything worked out so that when I see Whitney, it's powerful. But then after I did it with her, and it was so incredible, I said, can you get your mom to come down and join on the background? And she did. In comes Sissy Houston with her troupe. And then they're singing it. But then I said, no, you go join your mother. Now that was the sound of all know. Again, she's, she's not only the lead, but she's also part of the background with her mom. That's power. So all that power, you don't, you don't know where the mod is going up or down. It's just power. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I hate the way that transitioning yeah. death makes me appreciate or listen to someone's music like when a person transitions and I go back to their catalog, then I hear something. It's like another, another chamber opens. Yes. So before I ask you, because the thing is, is that I feel like right now, and you know, I'm, I'm a DJ that, that is very active and still spinning records. And I feel as though 
I want to dance with somebody is going through its September phase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. In which I, I will pretty much say that if I were to spend, I want to dance with matter of fact, like the, the, what I call the smells like teen spirit effect. That's what I want to dance with somebody. Cause of course it's like, okay, we're celebrating her and whatnot, but can you, can you please tell me what the air was like? And the tension of working on the second album where you guys now have to, first of all, are you ever thinking of like, okay, I gotta, I gotta live up to it. Like, you know, when you're working on rock a lot or whatever for like Aretha's next record or whatever, like I gotta, I gotta top freeway of love. I gotta like, what's your creative process in terms of like following up? Like, what was oh the gosh, difference yeah. between it? There, there are a few things I want to say. <clears throat> Clive Davis decided early on, after the success and fastest rising hit of the How Will I Know, being the number one on the third album, the, the third number one off that record, going so big, then he called me to meet him at the bungalow, his bungalow in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. It wasn't long after How Will I Know. Then he says, come meet me. So I go to meet him. He plays for me, I Want to Dance with Somebody Who Loves Me, as a demo. The same people who worked on How I Know, but the demo is kind of like very poppy, like a rodeo cut type of record, but it's cool. You know, oh, I want to dance. You can hear the hook in there, but the track is just so poppy. Like, I'm going, mm hmm. Immediately, I'm thinking, how am I going to make this a ghetto record? You know, really make it badass for the black people on the north side of Kalamazoo and around the world. That's my mind immediately goes. Then, he played me a few more songs that he, he wanted for Where the Broken Hearts Go, and maybe one or two more. And I played him one of Preston Glass's songs, uh, you know, that he had Preston had written. Uh, so you're saying he's planning this even as the first album has yet to really. Yes. Yeah, he's still, we're, okay. yeah, we're first album still, got, you know, but now, now he's like, he just decided because Whitney I worked so fast on How I Know. We turned it in so fast that he wants a, a fast second album to kind of be able to pick up on this success. So I get it. And he plays me these ideas. And then I come back to the same room where I'm sitting here with you right now, which I want you to come make your record. Tarpan Studios. Same studio. It, yeah, this is it. Wow. Okay. And um, I get Randy Jackson, who I adore, on that one finger synthesizer bass, Crowder Risci, my Italian style on the guitar. Walter Sanavi has not become a big producer yet for Titanic and all that, and with Mariah. He's in my, he's one of our stable cats, Preston Glass and my genius engineer, David Frazier. And I just take these ideas that, these, that Carl Clive has given me and just put my thing on it, our thing on it, which means Quincy Jones taught me an outhouse bottom with a penthouse view. Damn, okay. <laughs> and I put the vocals down, the lead vocals and the backing vocals. So it sounds like a finished record on five songs and one of those songs would be the Isaac Brothers song for the love of you because Whitney wanted to do that so before Whitney ever comes in the room it's all ready for her and 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 we are efficient because don't forget I've been a disciple of Guru I'm like I'm like a I'm like an army I'm like an army there's no drinking there's no smoking there's no drugs it's just vegetarian mm -hmm. life just like an army like your Fallon show you're on it 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 that's how it was in this room so when she came here, I played for her. I want to have somebody loves me. She was like, wow, I never heard it like that. And then I played for the, then the song I knew she didn't even like, which is Where Broken Hearts Go. And I played her that. I said, this is cut for you now. Then she goes, mm -hmm. now, now I'm starting to get it. Because now it's for her. Got the right bass. It's like, got the black on it. It's got the cool. So what I'm saying to you is, we, but I have to also say this now. The first song that she sang in this room was a song by the Isaacs for the love of you. And what was so great about doing that song first? Cause she said, I know that song. I have not even learned the other songs yet, but I know that for the love of you. So go on and I can sing that. So she sang that. I said, there are backing vocals on for the love of you. Stack your voice. So we started stacking her voice 20, 40 times. So it's all the harms are her voice. And she came back in the studio. Now she's hearing like angels, her voice. 
And I see the look on her face and she's getting inspired by the sound of her, her voice stacked that many times. And I said, tomorrow we're going to do, I want to dance with somebody who loves me. She's okay. Because she's high now. She's excited by the sound of her voice. And the next day she came in and, and we, we ran through uh, spoon feeding because she didn't know it. Here, do the verse, do the verse, you know, do, do, do a course, do a course, do an out course. Fine, okay, now put the whole thing together. Now go to the outro and just go crazy for me. And she stumbled upon, say you want to dance, don't you want to dance, don't you want to dance? Say you want to dance, don't you want to dance, say you want to dance. Oh, don't you want to dance, say you want to dance. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, will somebody who that came out of her? I was like, damn, I'm changing everything to go with that. With that now, that's gonna be the the highlight at the very end to go to, right? So that came out of her. So I'm saying, God came through. But I will say, we knew we wanted to make records that would last forever. We pray about it. She loved Jesus. We pray about it. You know, dear Lord Jesus, Savior, and all that. You know, help me do my best work. Whether people want to credit you or not, you are probably the most bullseye uh, standard of what we know as the 80s pop sound. I know that Prince was an architect. I know that Michael was a god and all that stuff. But when you sort of clean the room out, I can, I can only imagine what your life is like once you have the success with Whitney. But... Who was your guide to even, because I feel like every creator needs something to sponge off of mm -hmm. to be like, all right, this is what I'm going to create. But even at that, what was your phone line like? What was your life like? Like, I'm not even getting on Whitney, like the effect that it had on Whitney. What did the effect of the Whitney albums have on you in terms of, you know, demand? I need you to do my record. I need you to do my record. You got to, like, because I'm certain now if people are hiring you, they're expecting you to contribute the song that's going to also bring them to 12 billion units and 16 million units. Mm -hmm. Like, right. like, or even allowed the the freedom to just write a song that's not going to be hit, but this is a really clever song and da 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 da. Like, what is your yeah. life? I'd be allowed to write it. I'd be allowed to write it, but I was always knowing this is KBLX Quiet Storm format song. This is top 10 format song. This is R&B top 10 song. I could differ differentiate, because don't forget, at that time, we don't talk about it, but I'll talk to you now. Any artist that came through our door, Black artist, we had always think, how are we going to break them first on Black radio, R&B radio? We could just think pop. You think, yeah, you want to get the pop, but you have to first go through your R&B door. So we, we knew those worlds, R&B, pop, of course, country, you know, jazz, and then Quiet Storm, we're gonna have a hybrid, easy going music, which now becomes smooth jazz, whatever that is. So we knew the different categories. You had to know that as a producer, because if you didn't, you couldn't make it as a producer. You had to be making, no, no, this is gonna be do it. This is gonna give us the army radio, and then we have enough of the hook to go to pop radio and do well. Even, even the thinking with Clive Davis and Arista putting out you give good love first was to ingratiate right. mom and pops and black radio and our black community that she's ours before they came with a saving all my love for you and how I know that's for the world. That was a very thought about decision. You see what I'm saying? That's how it was at that time. Everything had to be a certain way. If it was a black artist. Now a pop artist, like you mentioned Starship, I'm not worrying about that because they're already, that's Gray Slick, we love. Mickey Thomas, killer singer. That's a band that we all know. They already had, we built this city and Sarah. They had damn hits, you know, mm -hmm. mean. So I got my electronic drums. Shut up, I got, 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 with that funk drive on it on a Diane Warren song. That became her first number one. And it was so strong. Right. I knocked myself out of number one. George Michael Aretha Franklin, the way for me, knocked myself out of number one. <laughs> That's how it was at that time. Because the drums, the sound, I knew was the power. You have Wait a minute, wait a minute. It. And we changed the sound to be like mighty. And don't forget what our competition was. Your friend, Prince, he had the hell of a drums. He knew it. And not only did he know it, he put, you, he put his foot up your, your butt about it. 
those drum checks you put down, look at Purple Rain. And, God, the sound is almighty. He was a mean scientist. And everyone you want to be competitive, you better be able to get down with it with these new machines or you're out. Can you please tell me about the sessions of Aretha and George with, I knew you were waiting for me, but could you also tell me about uh, Aretha and Whitney's, it isn't, it wasn't, it ain't ever going to be. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Like, did they do them together or what was this, those sessions like? Well, there's two two different records you're talking about now. Right, you're right. Talking, you asked first about the George Michael record. I'm excited. Okay. Sorry. Okay, I'm, I am too. <laughs> I am too, man. <laughs> I am too. Okay, so dig. Um, I knew you waiting for me as a Clive Davis pick. Clive said, I've met with George Michael. He wants to do a song with Aretha. He loves Aretha. I said, okay. And he said, I found this song. I'm going to send it to you. And Clive sent me the song. And powerful song, I knew you waiting for me. But again, it's the magic of my team to bring those chimes with Corrado on the synth guitar <laughs> on the very beginning against the drum. So you have to understand at that time, you had to have this new sound mm -hmm. before anybody even opened their mouths. Just the sound of the record had to be like a hit. Kind of like Motown, Brah! was a hit. I know you want that Brah! was a hit. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So right. in the electronic world, we had to put that thing down to sound good in this room with and 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 then lay it all out with the vocals, backing vocals, all sounding finished. Then when I went to, to Detroit, I had three days and it, they were on tape. So we only have 10 tracks a piece for Aretha and for George. Aretha comes in the first day, lays out her verses and choruses, and then not blowing on the end. I want to save that for a live thing with George. Then the next day comes in George. Aretha's not there. George is very nervous. He's very nervous. And he's a control freak. He's only produced himself. He's only had one guy produce him from that, do they know it's Christmas time? Beside that, he's done his own masterpieces. So we have 10 tracks for George. I'm going to just say this because this is important for my life. Yes. George goes on the mic and he sings the song. And he goes almost through, damn, 10 of those tracks. He goes through those damn 10 tracks. And I happen to know the first four tracks are my record because he was so strong. As he's gone to the sixth and the seventh and eighth track, is diminishing a little bit. He says to me, go back over those first tracks. I want to do more vocals. And that's when I became a producer. And I said, no, we're not doing that. These first four tracks... Five track. That's my record. That's the record. You think you're getting better, but in fact, you're diminishing. How do you how do you Jedi mind trick an artist to get out of their head? You have to say, just trust me. That's all you got to do. Because you say, go home. Let me comp this. When you come back tomorrow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play. I, I stay up all night. Go mm -hmm. home. I'm gonna put it together. And when you're here tomorrow, you come in fresh to do your you're backing. Fresh, yeah. You are coming fresh to do your ad libs with the, with the queen. Get your rest, because that's going to be the challenge. And if anything bothers you tomorrow, then we can do that. After I've had a chance to comb through what I know is, is my hit record. And then he said, okay. But he How looked at go. me like, who are you to talk to me like this, you know? He looked at me like, you know, who you think you are? But I had to let him know, George, you think you're getting better. But in fact, these first tracks were mighty. Yeah. So then he, he just, he gave in. He gave in. The next day, that was genius, because now he's meeting the queen. And the queen's happy to be meeting him because he's a big star. And then what it is, we have two mics. They, I have enough to do four rounds of ad-libs on the ending with two tracks a piece. Mm -hmm. And Aretha goes easy on those first tracks. She's you know just filling them out like a prize. It's like a prize fighter. She is a fucking prize fighter. She's a prize fighter. <laughs> but then on the on those on the third and fourth go rounds, she let him have it, man. Oops. And that's on that record. What you hear? And he's stunned. He's stopped because he could handle the power. No one can. So what I'm saying to you is I'm very proud of that record. Not only because it's number one, because the friendship that, that George and I made of him trusting me and me having to be strong to say, no, we're stopping. So like that. You do the same process 
Whitney Wait. and Aretha. Like, Whitney, do you prefer yeah. them okay, to that, sing that apart song, or that song? They were together. Cut, cut the tracks here. Go to Detroit United Sound with my engineer Dave Frazier. We fly over together. United yeah. Sound in the same studios where George Clinton be hanging out. I know. You know <laughs> we, we want the funk, all that stuff in the still same rooms. Q Q Tip has that board now. Who who does? Q Tip has the uh, oh. the, a, the API board. Yes. Okay. The API okay. board. Okay. Well, so what was that session? It's again like you have two women at the top of their game, two gods at the top of their game. How are you refereeing how the song's gonna go? That you're allowed to tell me, and I can tell yeah. by the look on your face, you gotta <laughs> hold some stuff back. <laughs> so... <laughs> they're both in heaven. They're both looking down upon us right now, and they're they're hearing okay. us, there. and they and they they give me love because uh, it was love. But this is what I gotta share with you, which you know, Aretha Franklin, I mentioned to you, a prize fighter is true. Whitney Houston's one of the greatest of all time. But Aretha, you I'm with Whitney with Aretha, Aretha was a little girl when her mother sang back up on those hits with Aretha. Aretha's a little girl. I mean, Whitney's a little girl around those sessions. So Aretha to Whitney is like, Auntie Riri, like Lassie, Auntie Riri. So sweet like that. So here I'm going to go with. I'm sitting at the board. Whitney's sitting on the floor. We get there early. She's on the floor time. You, you can't really see. She's just Frost leg on the floor. When Aretha comes to the door in her fur coat and and her prize fighter mode, like when De Niro goes into his modes to make his movies, already in character. She's in character to take this man or keep her man. So she looks at me, she goes, where is she? Like kind of harsh like that. Where is she? Where is she? Now you throw me off. Where is she? <laughs> Wait. Oh, 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 you mean Whitney? She's right here on the floor. And then she peers down to look at Whitney, you know. Oh, so you're Miss Houston. And Whitney's like, Auntie Riri. The cast was spelt right there. The song would be like, how are you gonna take my man? How are you gonna even sing about taking my man? She put that, 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 that thing on her right from the very beginning. Right from the very beginning. They redid the song. Whitney is so effortless at that time with her vocals. She did the most killer if I've ever heard her do. And then she left because she could feel that it wasn't a good vibe. And Aretha stayed. Aretha said, go to that part of the tape where she said she did that, that, that incredible thing. She didn't punch me in right after it. I said, okay. And we did. And she punched me in there again, make sure I, I do what I want to do. Because she wanted to make sure she was bringing her fire as strong as what Whitney had done, just effortlessly. Yeah. And we did. And then when she got what she wanted, which was killer, she left. But then she, she called me back on the phone and said, do you think I was too harsh today? I said, well, you might want to give her a phone call. She said, yes, I will. She said, I was in character for the song. I said, I know you were. But damn, when you're in character, I mean, you're like, you're like life <laughs> and death, man. Well, that's the thing. I I I always see a duet as like a collaboration. I never <laughs> like I'm not thinking that like Michael Jackson, and Paul McCartney about to start brawling. You know, like I'm gonna out sing you, you're out singing me. I think as the average listener, I wouldn't listen from the standpoint of like who's gonna win this battle. I'm thinking of like how they're gonna create magic together. It's so weird that how artists get in their heads. Well, wait, I might as well throw one more thing in, because I, if I remember correctly, I believe on that record, there's also the opening song is James Brown and Aretha Franklin. Yes. How How is that session? Because I've talked to Full Force before about working with James Brown, and <laughs> there's there's a lot of punch-ins and whatnot. Like, <laughs> Like when, James, when, James was uh, is my hero. You know, you're a drummer, so you know the power yeah. of, cold, of cold sweat. The power of cold sweat with what they put down was just like so far ahead. If you want to be respected as any kind of drummer, you had to be able to play cold, cold sweat. And so here I am in, in in this room with James Brown. You call him Mr. Brown. You don't call him James, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, right? And we had. He said, "I want cue cards." And first of all, he thought, "Where is she?" You know, he wanted to see Aretha. I said, "Well, she's not here." 
you you're coming in to sing your parts, and I'm going to go to Detroit and put her parts. So he was sad because he really uh, had a kind of a romantic thing in his mind about Aretha. Right. It'd be great that the king and the queen came together, and da, 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 da. he was all there, you know. <laughs> so we made these big cue cards. So here I'm holding big cue cards, you know. I'm kind of throwing them away as he's singing the song, throwing cue cards. But that's how he recorded, and he's a killer, just doing his grunts and his stuff, and, and, and reading the cue card and kind of being spontaneous. It was a killer session. I loved him. I loved you. And also, we had a, I knew he liked to play organ. So I had my organ in here. You go and fill it with the organ and play that. You and let him see, play organ? Yeah, I would. <laughs> yeah, no, I would because I know it would make him happy. See? And then he would say, You're the only one keeping the funk alive. Said, damn, Mr. Brown. Thank you for saying that. You're the only one keeping the funk alive. I said, damn, okay. So then I went back and could put a wreath on it. And Aretha killed it too. It just wasn't meant to be. And Prince, your bro, did a remix on that record. Did you know that's that? right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I okay. I heard. I heard an outtake of it. You are correct. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, guys. So was, yeah. I, I I apologize for 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 hogging this entire interview. Oh. You have any questions? Yeah, I, I was going to ask, man. Um, I wanted to ask about uh the the Temptations stay. Yes, yes. Um, I just thought that was just a, a brilliant move of sampling my girl to make a new song. Tell tell me about how that record came together and what that session was like, man. I love the Temptations. They're 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 Temptations four tops. That I have all that movement out of Motown was it's just it's just staggering. We're still learning from that catalog. We're still learning from those people. We're still learning. We're still trying to be half as good as what they put what they did, man. We're just so to work with Temptations was a, was a big deal. And then Otis Williams is the only living member mm. that I worked with him, and um, I loved his wisdom. So it brought some out of me after I met with him to record some songs. It brought this out of me to kind of go, what can I do that would just really be something different? And I just, God said, you sample the beginning of my girl. Boom, 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 you know, and put a new song on top. Kind of what was coming out of New York again. You had a lot of cats taking other records and putting different songs on top. Yeah. So it wasn't a new, a brand new thing, but it was a brand new thing to do for the temptation. That's what it is. Temptation, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's what we did. Stay till the morning, baby. Rock me slow, like I wanna rock you. Doom, 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 doom. On top of my girl. Yeah. So I had to give Smokey Robinson half the song because he wrote my girl. No problem. Right, right. <laughs> and we got to know the other half, and it became a hit for us. And they got a platinum record, man. Out of all those years, here they are platinum, and then they're going for the Grammy and all that stuff. So it made me very happy. But that's what it was. I was just really wanting to have a hit. And I thought, if I take something old, like a wedding, something old, something new, that might that might be the that might be the thing, and it was. That's so, it. when when you're approached about Mariah Carey's first album, yes. Now, unlike Whitney Houston, which, again, no nobody had a, a inkling of a clue what was a, headed down the road. Yeah. Now that you know that there's a. A, a standard, a road to follow. When Tommy and Donnie are bringing you Mariah Carey, are they putting the invisible pressure on you to put some numbers on the board, just like you did for your other star student? Yeah, no, they are. We're not, we're not talking numbers. We're not talking pressure. It's just um, the first phone call came from Tommy, not Donnie. Donnie, I knew from working with Clive. Now he's over at Sony, but I didn't really have a relationship to him at Sony yet. So it was really, Tommy called me. He says, I, I found this girl and I want to send you a, a picture and, and, a, and a song mm -hmm. uh, on her. And then, you know, uh, and if you like her, let me know. He said, but, he said, but don't mack my babe. Okay, all right. Oh, I'm, mar I'm, mar I'm married, you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> mm. And then the mail comes, a little tiny slide of her. That big. And a cassette. So I listened to the cassette and I said, oh yeah, she sings really nice, you know? So I let him know, you know, she's, whatever I'm hearing is cool. He's like, would you fly to New York and meet her? I said, yes, I will. Because don't forget, Matola was a present for Sony now. Big label. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew if he had his attention on something, it, it could be like something we really want to like take serious. So here I go to New York, go meet her. And in all respect, Mariah, when I first met her, was extremely shy. Not the Mariah you see now where she's out front and talking and, you know, and like da 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 Right. She, was, she would have the hair on one side of her face and talk to you with hair on one side of the face, very quiet. 
And I would say, well, like, well, what do you, what artist do you like? You know, oh, I like George Michael. That's great. I just work with George Michael. You know, I just, just did. I, I knew you're waiting for me. So I said, you know what? Why don't we go? Where I can hear you sing on a mic. Let's just go to some studio, and just not sit around and talk. Let's just go and do some music. So we did. We went over to Sony Studio. A mic for her. A mic for me. And my my friend wrote the piano, and we wrote four songs. And I was surprised how fast she writes. And then I was surprised how good she sings. Then I was even more surprised that she could do like a young Michael Jackson. Well, mm -hmm. like that's not easy to be like, to imitate a young Michael Jackson. She could do that. Then it hit me who I was messing with. That it wasn't just some other whatever. How did you discover the whistle? Because you unleashed the whistle to the world. Well, in honesty, Vision of Love, where she goes in that big whistle, she cut that vocal on her own with her other cat. I didn't cut that whistle. They had already cut that jam. When I okay. got with her, I did a jam called I Don't Want to Cry. I Don't Want to Cry. My bad. My bad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then right. I got, and then we got into all that on that record, knowing, wow, you know, she, she could do it. So then we really just perfected it and just got what she wanted. And then I started realizing what a perfectionist she is. She even had me send that tape back to New York because she wanted to fix one, one, one riff. Mm. Oh, wow. When we send tape across the country with one riff, which is already genius, it was. But we did. That's how I realized what her standard was at that time. She wanted to be so shy to now being like, send me the tape. So we did. We got it back and it wasn't that much different, but she was a damn killer. And then from there, Tommy says, what you're doing on these songs, I want Vision of Love to sound like and, and the album. So then they sent us Vision and then we just, we went in and made Vision of Love sound more the track and with her voice and everything like what we we're doing on the other right. music that's what we did and then, that, and then and then she exploded man she just exploded yeah. so is that is that part exhausting because la la and face said the same thing jamila said the same thing which is basically before you even work with an artist artist you have to go and get to know them and spend time with them is is there a situation in which or besides Dion work in which it was a struggle to get the artist to be vulnerable, to trust you, to, okay. You know what I do? You know, Quest, I got you. You know what I do, Quest? I what? push I push past it. I push past it. I ignore it. I push past it. I just push past it and say, try this. Try that. Try this. So fast, they're off balance. But now before you know it, things are just magically happening. What was the hardest song you had to cut? Like, go back, recall it, recall it, recall uh, it. Lover for Life, Clyde was not happy with Lover for Life for Whitney. And not because we didn't, we didn't cut it great, but he had a demo of it. And the demo had a bass drum pattern in five. It wasn't in four, it kept changing. I thought that wasn't gonna be the, the way because it wouldn't land on one. So, so I, yeah, cut, I cut it my way, I cut it in Nina Baker way, I cut it a few different ways, you know? But he, he couldn't get happy. I said, well, what is it with this thing, you know? It was the demo, I love the demo. I said, but the demo, just so you know, the bass drum is moving and it's not landing on downbeats, which we expect as listeners in a way. He goes, well, maybe that's what I like about it, that demo that it's kind of floaty. I go, well, then let me do that if that's what it is. And then he was happy. He wanted the bass drum to move around. So he then has demo-itis. Yeah, then we got happy. So when you said the hardest song, it was the hardest song. It was just discovering when people like a demo and they like something that working about a demo, then... <laughs> You got to realize well, what is he like about that thing, you know? One of the most heartbreaking things, I I think when um, she passed away, I believe I heard you say that you guys were considering cutting Brainstorms, Lovin's Really My Game. Yes, she was crazy about that record. I didn't even know that record that much. She was saying, you know, Lovin' is really Damn, my, game. my game. Yeah. Yes. And I said, oh, I've heard it. She goes, no, no, no. I love that record. Would you cut it for me? I said, sure, I will, honey. I'll do anything you want me to do. Oh, and I, and I cut it. And I cut it. And it was mean. It's in my vaults right now. She cut I, the vocals? No. Shit, I, call, I call the estate. I call down in Atlanta. She's in Atlanta. Oh, uh, well, she's just not feeling well to want to sing right now. No, and now, now she's going off to do a tour. Now she's doing, it would always be like something going on. 
I said, but I'm, I'm bringing what she's asking for. Well, <sighs> she just can't do it. So we never could get her to sing it. And then I saw her for the last time after I'd cut it at one of those Clive things the year before she passed. Right. You know, and she came and jumped on me. We just like hugged and kissed and Randy Jackson was witnessing it. It was like, oh my God, you know. And she, we just loved each other. And I said, I got it. I, I cut what you want me to cut. Oh, I want to sing it. I said, yeah, I know. Let's do it. But it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't to be. It wasn't to be. Yeah, man. Like Bel Belita Woods of Brainstorm was what, like one of the most unsung champions of, of soul singing. And that would have been such a brilliant uh because no i mean when people think of brainstorm they think of this must be heaven for yeah. quiet storm but like loving is really my game was like mm -hmm. that was a thing like i remember that when i was a kid mm -hmm. um for but you, you but you, i have to say one more thing it was whitney also su suggested i cut i'm every woman for bodyguard that wasn't Clive. that was whitney so she uh -huh. had a really good idea you know of what she wanted to get into like that record you love a brainstorm so there you go yeah well Dude, I, I I can I, I don't even know how to unwrap this thing because there's so much <laughs> shit. Fuck it, Eddie. Ah, all right. I might as well ask it because I'm I'm not gonna have an opportunity ever again. What was it? What was it like working with 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 Eddie Murphy? Because you did put your mouth on me. Love Eddie. Oh, Eddie, Eddie. Eddie came here, man. First you of all, that <laughs> yes. You know, I forgot he did big, it, but yeah, big, I remember. Big, oh, big that's fan. right. You're in the video. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a massive Eddie fan. Uh, you know? and and Rick James at the Sausalito studio, they, they did the power all, party all the time. Wow, and you know, they had massive success, so Eddie was like swinging. It wasn't like some joke anymore, it was like, You're, you're a recording artist, man. So I said, Well, what do you want to write about? What kind of song you want to do? I said, You know, just give me some inspiration. What do you want to talk about? And he said, Put your mouth on me. I said, okay. <laughs> Okay, his Put version of his only I thought his version of Kiss or something like yeah, right, right, that's right. that's the vibe. Yeah, just, I figured, I figured, mm -hmm. just right. vibe, just vibe, and we did it, you know. And I loved him, and he like again can imitate all those great voices in here. Michael, everybody, Elvis Presley, anything you want. He's just a gifted cat, man, and but very quiet when he's not working. That I discovered. Yeah, kind of like Richard Pryor. These great comedians are very quiet when they're not doing what they do. They live in the head. You got this, you know, you got to, you know, so it, it makes sense. I, I, well, just my question, I, I just wanted to ask about a song. Um, It was on the last uh, My Vision album that you wrote called In My Life. Ah! Do you remember about anything about that session or writing yes. that song? That was the most beautiful album done at Hunky Chateau in France, out in the country. Mm -hmm. And it was so beautiful because we had this massive room and it was like a, a kind of a barn in that the back window, the back door behind my drums could open. So you could see the whole countryside out back behind my drums, which took me a little more time to mic the drums and get the sound I wanted because of the openness. But in that room it was just so pastoral in the feeling. And that's when we cut on that album, all this high synthesizer guitar, inner worlds and miles out. It was just like, oh my God. After all that, then Vishnu said, thank you for the flowers and trees in the morning. Just this beautiful little thing. And I kind of chime in something, you know, whatever I bring to it, a little bridge area. But it was really Vishnu that had that thank you for. And yeah. Carol King came to me, make it Kungas, acoustic piano, completely opposite of what we had just cut. And... You know, Vish is something else, man. I gotta say about that guy, man. He's yeah, no, nah, man. We um, <laughs> my group, my rap group, our little brother. We actually we sampled that song. For oh, okay, life. okay. And we and cleared it, and um, it was like literally at the last minute. We you know had, had our people working on this stuff, but we hadn't heard anything. And so a buddy of mine had played with my Vish in his mm -hmm. band. Oh, I he see. Like, yo, he was like, yo, man, I got his email. We can try. I'm like, all right, I'll try. Hail oh. Mary. I emailed him. Was like, hey, man, this is my group. I tell him what it is. He was on vacation with his family and yeah. he came back. He's like, hey man, I'm on vacation, but you know, I think it's great. You know, we'll do it. And and they cleared it. And so okay. um, oh, nah, thank you, man. Like that oh. was a beautiful song. And um oh. nah, is is there do you have a close but no cigar moment of an artist you were supposed to work with? Not Dion Ward, but yeah, no, there are a few. I met with Madonna 
and oh, I was about what, to make the album. Be, what year? Be, well, she had just made. Um, I gave her those high heels that she wore in that song called Borderline, the yellow high mm-hmm. heels. That those are came from me, I get from me. She came to visit me. I picked her up at the airport in San Francisco. We had a great meeting. She loved Stacy Ladazal. She loved my music with Stacy because she was hot on that kind of a vibe. And then she went to New York, and but a week later she called and said, "You know what? I'm going to stay in New York. Now. I work with Now Rogers." I said, "Okay." She goes, "I'm just loving New York." I, I go, "I get it. I get it. I get it." Because I was in the hot about here, relaxing. You know, she goes, "I." You know, so and then she made like, like a virgin. Damn, she made with the my man. You know, shoes in borderline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is crazy. Yeah. Um, look, man, I, I oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. I, I, I need my one or two questions. Um, okay. Okay. and I, I, yeah, I just got to pick your brain about a couple of, okay. of names that uh, our viewers may or may not remember or know okay. Okay. from your early days as a drummer. Um, I'm a big CTI Records fan, as people might know, Cree Taylor. And you worked with um, Alan Holdsworth yes. on an album called uh, Velvet Darkness in 1976. Do you have any memories of those sessions and Alan yes. Holdsworth? Yes. Uh, Alan uh, asked me to come and record with him at CTI. He's a guitar player, I, by the way. Yes, everybody. he's one of the most brilliant guitar players in the world, was Alan Holdsworth. And we all know he's very sensitive. And I go in there and on keyboards is a cat who was from Tony Williams' band, Alan Al, Al Pasquale, Clavinet Keys, and on bass from Weatherport, Alfonso Johnson. Oh, oh wow. And uh, I go in there with my drum kit. It's a white Gretsch kit with the enamel double painted on the inside, which sounds, they aren't like vibes, clear, but they're, but they're mighty like that. And so then Alan starts showing us these songs. And as he saw, shows the song, then we play the song and then we would cut it. Then we we maybe, maybe cut it maybe a second time and that'll be that. Then, you know, we kind of went through those songs like that. In his mind, he's thinking he's just kind of showing us the songs and we're gonna, you know, come back another time or whatever he's thinking. I don't know. But Cree Taylor and Rudy Van Gogh, the great engineer, they were loving it and that was what they wanted to get that live, fresh, raw vibe. And then they wanted to put it out. And Alan wanted to do more, do more takes and whatever he wanted to do. You know, <laughs> so there's some discrepancy between his concept and maybe what theirs was but i was just doing what i was asked to do and being paid to do whatever it was so th- that was the album it came out and i'm proud of it I'm proud to say i worked with alan Holdsworth. also i want to say one more thing in that same room there were two pianos black pianos that were owned by rudy van gelder the great engineer that herbie hancock or silver these genius had played on these damn pianos and his wife had cancer so he needed some money so he said i want to sell one of my pianos I had just made $40,000 with wired sales from Jeff Beck. So I said, I'll buy one of these pianos. And I bought it. And that became my piano for Let Me Be Angel, Dynamite, jump, jump, uh, Freeway of Love, all my hits on that same piano. So that's part of that connection. But it was oh, a wise investment. <laughs> wow. God um, damn. You, you also played on a, a, a historic recording on a Jaco Pistorius record with Sam and Dave and uh, Come On, Come On, Come Over. Do you have any memories of that? Yeah, I do. Jocko and I became friends from Miami. That's where I first met him. That's why I suggested I bring him to Weatherport when I was asked to join Weatherport. I didn't want to join Weatherport. I want to go tell him bowling and do rock and roll, get panties on the stage and go that way. And they said, well, can you bring a baseball? I said, well, I know a cat crazy named Jocko from Florida. So Joe said, I think I've heard of him. So we flew him out to LA and he came and does this great jam called Cannonball on Black Market. He mm-hmm. started playing that song and adding all the stuff to it because he so he had so much ideas. And then Joe stops in the middle and says, don't play that shit on my song. And it kind of freezes Jocko. <laughs> you know what I mean? And what it does is it makes Jocko become Jocko. Now he's more thoughtful. Everything he plays puts it in the right place. Really? And people kind of go, damn, he is genius. After the, he joined that band and made Weather, Heavy Weather, with a remark you made, Teen Town, those great pieces. He does a solo album, and then because we're friends, he asked me to come play on "Come Come On Come Over," and I went to a place in on top of a garage, the home studio of the great drummer Bobby Columbia from Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Ah. He was producing that album, so this is his studio on top of the garage where I played his drums, a roll of horn cats, you know, like Tom Malone, those type people, and then the rhythm section all in the same room with Jocko, and. Sam Moore, maybe like that. Yeah, it was live. Bitter. 
just the funk but i didn't did uh the funk you know it's like one or two yeah. takes that was it wow. but jocko is mean in heaven right now he's looking down he's mean he's like ollie on the bass mean mm -hmm. <laughs> my my final question because okay Every hip hop producer will kill me if I don't ask this, okay. because both both you and Ed Green yes. are credited with drumming on "Come Dancing." Mm -hmm. Who is playing the actual breakbeat at the top of that song? Is that you or Ed Green? Me. I wrote that song, and I cut okay. the song. Yeah, and then later on, when I heard it on the record after I bought the record, quite frankly, I heard Ed Green on there. And it was cool because he just made it a little even fatter. They, they overdubbed him on it to make it even fatter. I was like, damn. Isn't that I, I didn't weird know. though? In fact, in fact, like, all the Jan Harmer stuff, all this stuff on Wired, I didn't hear any of this stuff until it came out and bought it. Oh, wow. Jan overdubbed all his stuff. Ed Green had overdubbed this thing. That's how it was. In fact, Jan Harmer didn't mix the album. It wasn't even mixed by Beatles producer George Martin. It was mixed by Jan because Jeff went up there and fell in love. And that's what he wanted. Oh, that wow. edgy sound. And that's what it was, man. So I started out, boom, Scott, boom, Scott, boom, boom, Scott, boom, 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 Scott, boom, boom, Scott, boom, boom, Scott, boom, 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 I'm fucking going bang. I don't go gang. I boom, boom, egg it. I boom, boom, skang, yeah, boom. I boom, boom, skang. I boom, boom, skang, I go all that, yeah. Wow. Then they bring it out on top of me. Fan, <laughs> fans of uh, Balloon Mind State, uh, you know, and De La Soul are very familiar with that drum break in. Okay. I, I had to ask that question. It's it's okay. it's it's the song they sampled on a uh, area codes. Um, look, I I have to say that very rarely does an episode of Quest Love Supreme go beyond what I thought it would be, and the fact that there's even twelve more hours of questions I have for you. Um, shows you know how 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 much of a god you are in in and and as in your creativity and i just simply want to thank you for taking the time out for these last almost two hours to to share these stories man because like the world doesn't know how awesome you are man and you know i i, I just say thank you that's thank you, Quest Man. I'm a, I'm a fan of I love your work. I love your brilliance, how you bring a tuba in with your drums on the shows and things like that. <laughs> you, you, you know, you, 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 you bring these eclectic things that it's like, wow, that's keeping the funk raw, man. So dig well, you, man, you. and would love to work on something with you. I was you gonna say when I'm you. when I'm out there next, we gotta meet in, in person and and, okay. and shop it up or something. So we'll okay. definitely stay in contact. That'd be beautiful. Um yeah, on on behalf of, of the family of Quest Love Supreme, Fonsegalo, Super Bill. I'm giving them new names. <laughs> Amazing Steve, Laia, uh, cousin Jake, and, and Brittany, and and Fontigolo, and the great Narda Michael Walton. This is an awesome damn episode of Quest Love Supreme. Now, now we've been waiting on this one for a long time, man. Seriously, thank you for Woo! doing it. Thank you. Thank yes. you too, Cass, man. Right, I really love it. This has been a highlight for me. I knew it was coming. And uh, you know, thank these you. are the type of things that when you do interviews, you know, you want to make sure you're saying the right things that you're giving the love. And a lot of our people we're talking about are in heaven, the Jocko, the Aretha, the Whitney's, and they're looking down and, and with us right now. Like, what Absolutely. you gonna say, man, you better keep 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 me alive. Absolutely. Don't be, don't be forgetting about me now. Never. I'll hope you, I'll, I'll hope you. Never. <laughs> we'll see you on the next go around. Thank you.